do it. I'll try okay. This video has three upcoming parts. The War of the Roses, Edward III, the father of all the, all the grandfather of all the War of the Roses participants, and Henry VII, the concluder of the War of the Roses. So, sit back and enjoy this history lesson. And if you like different, like the in more bite-sized pieces, check out the original playlist of the history of England. Anyways, enjoy the movie. See you at the end. Welcome to the home of my brand new studio. It's Talking Time with Kathleen. I'm the day ninety eight, and my guest you met you might have met him last year. We talked about the War of the Roses, but today we're going to talk about the prequel. And introduce yourself. Uh, hello, I'm the Venerable Beat. Uh, yeah, I like uh, English history. It's my favorite history, and I have a bone to pick with people who think Edward the Third is one of the greatest monarchs in English history, but yeah, yeah. I think I mentioned the last episode, but you you named after a, a famous writer or po poet from the mid, the early England. Yeah, so um, in the eighth century, I'm pretty sure there's uh there was a dude who wrote the first ever history book for um, what will later be the English people, the Anglo-Saxons, the ecclesiastical history of the English people. Um, I'm named after him, the Venerable Bede. Uh, yeah, uh, he he was from Northumbria. I don't know how to... In the north, essentially, the northeast by Scotland. He did not like... Uh, Mercians or Welsh people. <laughs> what about the the Saxon people? Uh, I mean, he didn't have a big hate for them because they weren't really on his border. Okay, because they were down more um, down south, but Wessex, yeah. e e Wessex, and Essex or Essex or. I know. I know. Essex. I was, all I can pronounce yeah. this. I can pronounce it as Wessex. That's where Alfred yeah. came from. Yeah, you've got Wessex, Essex, um, uh, Middlesex, and those are the traditionally Saxon kingdoms. I mean, it's it's most definitely more complicated than that. But yeah. uh, Bede is from the Anglian area. Uh, uh, so he'd be dealing with um, angles as he would see them, and was an angle. But this guy was more of, 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 a, of, a, of a more in this. He's, he is more Norman French. Ah, uh, yeah, Edward the Third. He was part of the Angevins. Uh, well, the Plantagenets who were descended not only from the Normans, but also earlier lords of Anjou, which is in France, uh, just to the south of Normandy. Yeah. Yeah, they, they had a little big... They, after a while, they, they got pretty much big, a little big empire down there. Yeah, yeah, which, they did. Uh, which we Henry might, II. Yeah. yeah. Henry II. So we, yeah, if we ever go in more depth with the Hundred Year War in the future, we could... How that how they all got together? How maybe we can talk about how the pieces can all came together and then all fell apart again. Back went back. Yeah, to well, actually, um, they held more land in France. Oh, okay, never mind. Well, they did of earlier hold a lot of land in France, um, in the twelfth century as well. Yeah, but the Hundred Years' War is sort sort of caused by that uh 
dynamic of a of monarchs having to also be uh, subject to another monarch. Yeah, I think after that, Br- after the after that, I think after this, Brit- the British probably were less focused on the European holdings and, and then more more of the empires like America, India, and Australia stuff later on after they lost a lot of but- European stuff. They were actually extremely invested in Europe as well. Mostly, their their main thing is don't let one power control Europe because if they do, they'll yeah. uh, attack us. So what they would do is usually try to maintain the status quo and powers, and uh, this would eventually lead to World War One. But you know, and they kept. Calais up until uh, Queen Mary the first, which is definitely oh, that, that would be uh, Henry Henry the seventh's first daughter, right? Henry the eighth's uh, oh, first right. daughter. Yeah, ah, it's okay. There's like Her, a million his, of them. Henry the seventh's granddaughter. Yes, Henry the seventh's granddaughter. All right. So, do we want to start up this presentation? Yep. Sure. Right. Okay, so here's the title screen, everybody. Yep, Edward the Third. We're going to be talking about him, uh, kind of surface level, but more in depth than you'd probably get from a history of England. This is probably. Do you think this is an accurate painting of him? No, this this I think was painted in the 16th century. Oh, like way um, after his time. Yeah, Ed, Edward is 14th century. Okay. Uh, and he'll actually have to deal with the uh, Black Death later on. So. <coughs> so, so to set up what's going to be going on in his rule, we have to set up the governmental system of England. And this is feudalism. You should probably know what feudalism is. You have your monarch. He gives land to um, loyal subjects who then have people underneath them. And it's kind of a military caste system. Okay. Uh, The early monarchs uh, in 1066, of course, William the Conqueror comes across the channel and conquers England. And from then on, he uses uh, the Norman kings... Uh, there were th- only three Norman kings, technically. Um, they uh, William, were William the First, William the Second, and Henry the First. Yeah, uh, they used their military might, their ability to. Uh, I, um, I guess Steve, but Stephen count as one, or or not? Or was he a t- 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 <laughs> his, his mother came through his mother's side? I guess. It, yeah, it came through. It came through his mom. Uh, he was a grandson, so, so he's he's, like a- he's kind of he's he's harder to place, but uh, Blois is that was his father's name, but yeah, he, he's. I don't think, I'm Blois. thinking people ever count the house of Blois very well. Like it goes from Norman to the Angevins, really. Yeah, well, that ultimately comes up from your first major issue with the English feudal system under William, the first William, William, the second and, and Henry, the first, they were almost constantly at war and they were able to hold down, uh, the, the feudal Lords, mostly by going to war in France, constantly trying to ensure, uh, William, the first actually went to war for su- William, the not William, the first William, the second, uh, he was the second son of William the first. So, it, but he was given England, and his uh, eldest elder brother, uh, Robert Curthose, was given Normandy. So they would fight over who was going to be Duke of Normandy and King of England. But Henry the uh, first, who was their youngest brother, would eventually, uh, most likely kill <laughs> Henry the first. Most likely killed um, William the second, allegedly. Uh, And then took the throne. But uh, Henry I had a son 
but his son would die after a successful campaign. They were coming back to England from Normandy, and uh, I think it's called the White White Ship disa- Disaster. Oh, you said you said, you said Henry the First. You mean? Yeah, Henry the First son. Yeah. The White Ship Disaster leads to a succession crisis. Henry the First does not have a son. He has a daughter. But he has a daughter, Empress Matilda. I guess back and, then that people weren't so iffy about female rulers. Yeah, and especially in England where um, at first uh, William the Conqueror set up England in a way that no one man could become more powerful than the king. But if all of the nobles came together, they would essentially be more powerful than the king. So you, you'd you have to ensure that not only were you uh, popular, but you were strong and could show that strength. And women can't, in this society, uh, in, th- in this f- feudal medieval society, show yeah. strength like a man could, even though she at one point was married to uh, the Holy Roman Emperor. I forget. Yeah. Was it really until... We talk about Mary, Mary, Mary the first at the first, yeah, first female ruler in England at least. Yeah, and even uh, she had a tough time. It, uh, that whole thing is more cemented by Elizabeth, but yeah. yeah. Well, so, she also had the time of, of being the opposite, like of being the opposite religious as most of the community too. Yeah. Well. Kind of. It's complicated. Yeah, like I said, that's, that's another topic. We're getting, yeah. we're getting like a few generations away right now. Yeah, so now Henry the First is in a tough spot. He gives the aristocracy, known as the barons. Yes, uh, that's another thing. Like back when the the, uh, the Wessex kings were on the thing, the Wessex were aboard. The, the, I think the king divided the land between the earls. Now the now the, the Tiles are barons now. Uh, Eldormen, yeah. Oh, um, not earls. You you did have you did have earls during oh. this period as well. Uh, earl, the original Anglo-Saxon word was Eldorman. Okay. Um, but you do have the invention of the world uh, word, not world, Earl, uh, in response to the uh, Scandinavian term Jarl. They kind of mix together, and like, you do get you, like like when yeah, like you, the Vikings were charged like Can- Canute and Hardlefoot and I can't remember those names Hardicut, Harda Canute, yeah, yeah uh, those, they come in and they uh, the uh, the Dane law um, on this map you can kind of see it uh, it's up in the west uh, opposite from the red stuff on the map that was called the Dane law. But yeah, um, Henry the first, in order to get the, the nobles to accept his daughter, essentially, he gives the barons some amount of promises on how he's going to conduct himself as king. So this is your first, uh, sort of, Promise the, that you begin at the, the beginnings of the parliament in the, fu- of the future. No, uh, okay. par- parliament's a little bit later, but the barons are starting to see that if they work together, they can leverage power against weak or unpopular monarchs, and that will be important a couple of generations later. Uh, yeah, you have the anarchy, but that eventually ends. The anarchy, uh, Stefan of Blois fights Matilda nearly his entire reign, which I think was like 1235 to 1254, somewhere around there. It was a long period of time. So now you ha- you actually have extremely what? powerful barons. <laughs> Who did you say was that, that time frame? Uh, Stefan of Blois. And I think, I think I think I think I think it's more of eleven. R- r- 11. Yeah, eleven. I, I yeah, eleven. Because eleven thirty-five. William was the ten sixty-six. Eleven fifty-four. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry. That's why um, I'm here for. It. <laughs> like, like, <wait> a minute. <laughs> yeah, this eventually leads to the Angevin dynasty, uh, or the Plantagenets. It, it 
in the earlier period, they're called the Angevins because uh, they are descended from Geoffroy Plantagenet, uh, who was Count of Anjou. And they eventually, they actually, Henry II, the son of Matilda, becomes essentially, <laughs> he controls more of France than the king of France. But oh, yeah. uh, also before you go on, I also heard that one of the reasons, one of the reasons, the book I read, I might, the book might be wrong though, that one of the reasons that the barons kind of supported Stephen more than uh, Matilda is because the Normans and the Angevins were kind of like, didn't get along very well down there. Um, Yeah, that could be part of it. I I don't know if she was actually married to Joffrey at first. I think that happens l later. I'm not sure on when that happens. But uh, I think it was more Stephen just was we, in we, England. We, at, yeah, he was Stephen there. Was, yeah, he was in England at the time. He was a man, and he was able to seize the uh, uh, treasury and like 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 Henry the First did when when William the Second William the Second died. Well, Henry uh, the First uh, and yeah, William the Second. Yeah, uh, it, exactly, exactly like that. He he was like, oh, okay. Um, uh, where was I? Oh no, oh, uh, Henry the Second. Oh, sorry, I I, I can't keep you know, think, think to talk about, but if no one knows this. Uh, like feudalism, it's like you have say 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 you have a, a lot of land, right? And you and you chuck and you chuck it in the four pieces and say, okay, you can have, yeah, you can have this piece, this piece, this piece, and this piece of land. You four of them, can, uh, otherwise among you four, as long as you as long as you're still loyal to me and your soldiers fight for me, then you can have you can own this land. But I, technically, I own it still, but. And then later yeah. on, they're like, "Hey, let's divide our land up in pieces and give to give, give the little 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 nobles, smaller nobles, and so on, so forth and so forth." So you got yeah, essentially. Yeah, essentially, and, and this is uh, because, of course, uh, centralization is uh, a difficult problem when all you have is like horses and stuff. Uh, it actually gets a little bit better later on, but yeah. Um, so William the Conqueror sets up various tiny little lords that can't uh, by themselves compete with the King of France. I mean, King of England. Yeah. Uh, but if they all unite, and this is very important for uh, Empress Matilda's grandson, John, who was never supposed to... Uh, who is never supposed to come to the throne. He was known as John Lackland because he yeah. was so far down the pecking order, he didn't get any land. Yeah, they divide the land between, at this by him point, England, Normandy, uh, Anjou, and then the, the then and then the land that Henry II's wife brought Henry II's wife brought into the I forget what, what, uh, what Aquitaine. Aqu Aquitaine. Aquitaine. Aquitaine land too. So yeah. Like four different lands. For, Divided between and Brittany. All, all his kids. Also Brittany. Oh yeah, Brittany uh, too. Yeah, and uh, also the Lordship of Ireland. But yeah. I, I didn't know Ireland, Ireland was conquered by this point. Uh, they, they had... It wasn't conquered, but they did have land over there, and yeah. they they were given the title Lord of Ireland. So it, that's a very complicated story. Good afternoon, Scott. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, so Henry the First, in order to get the uh, nobles on his side, gives them some rights. John Lackland, though, comes along. He's very unpopular, uh, as you can, because he's uh, this is uh, Robin Hood. Robin Hood, the myth of Robin Hood comes. Uh, Robin Hood's around this time. Uh, and at this point, Philip uh, Augustus of France, the, the monarchs of France, because of the way the feudal system worked in uh, France, they didn't have much power at the beginning. Okay. 
yeah, like I said, they they gave the land the hope that the landowners would be loyal to them. Most of the time, they weren't. They, they're loyal to themselves more than the king. Yeah, and they had given them big tracts of land. But Philip Augustus would see a renaissance in French power, essentially. And now John, who just so happens to be Duke of Aquitaine, uh, I think he was Count Duke of Brittany, uh, Duke of Normandy, Count of Anjou. He has all these lands in France. And there's a fight between Philip and him over... Okay, you are going to be subservient to me because you own lands in France. Even though you're a king on your own, you have to pay homage to me for the lands you own in France. And John isn't having it, so uh, Philip Augustus actually starts confiscating his land, and he has to go down, and he has to fight for his land, essentially. And they did a very good job at it. No, he ends up losing. He's unpopular because of this. All of the barons come together and say... We're done with you. We, uh, we want our rights back. You've been impinging on our rights. And this is actually when Magna Carta is established. Yeah. Still not technically parliament. Parliament is still a little bit later. More I, under... I, I, would say, uh, I would say it was kind of like maybe the prequel to it almost. The, the barons. Yeah. Yeah, the prequel to it. Like, uh, like the, Parli- House of, House, the House of Lords. Not the Commons, obviously. but the Yeah. The Lord House. Uh, par- Parliament is more established under the uh, adolescence of Henry the Third, who is John's son. son. Yeah. Uh, John dies unexpectedly, unexpectedly in twelve sixteen, while he's trying to flee the barons because he's a he's at war with them. <laughs> yeah. Also, kind of. In the future, his grandson or great grandson, I forget which one it is, but almost had the same issue, but in reverse, when he decided that the Scottish people were, were his vassals and they're like, no, we're kings. Like, no, you're my vassals. Like, like no. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Ed- Edward the First, the the grandson of John Lackland and the grandfather of Edward the Third. It was more he was trying to, uh, he didn't want to have the threat of Scotland behind him while he's trying to um, ensure his holdings in France. So uh, he more wanted to put on John Balliol as a uh, loyal king who would be nice to England. But of course, the Scottish people didn't like that. And it became a whole mess. Braveheart, you know, except Braveheart is not historically accurate. (laughs) Not at all. The Battle of Stirling Bridge became a battle on open point. Never mind. <laughs> I said that's, a, that's a, another podcast episode, but later. In the <laughs> yeah. Um, this, is why we, this is why we have extra time to set up because we, we go on these tangents a lot. Yeah, I, I made sure to put a family tree so that you would, so that you guys could. Uh, uh, that's Edward the Third's kids. Well, no, it, it's oh, from Henry. I think Henry the. <laughs> Uh, third. third, yeah, 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 and it goes Edward the first, Edward the second, yeah, yeah, to make sure because this is going to be you know, dynasties are a little confusing, but uh, what's going to be important for the reign of Edward the third's father is next. Edward the second is the Marcher Lords. I, I just want you to go back a little, oh, quick. all right. Not, not uh, that, that the the red spots though yeah. that's the that's the English well the Welsh marches uh march means border these yeah. uh these lords had a lot of power because of course yeah. they're on the boundary uh between England and Wales there it was around uh, this time that England fully incorporated Wales in their system yeah, Ed- Edward the First conquered Wales, so they, these uh, people had castles. They uh, they held a lot of power. Now you can go to the next one. Right. Now it's not mentioned here, but Edward the Second's wife was the daughter of the King of France. Yes, is is Isabella of France, and that's actually very important for for later. Yes, it is. Um, I made sure to put in uh, br- from Braveheart. That's Edward II in Braveheart. Um, he was 
he was a weak ruler and he was easily influenced by the people around him and he liked being around the people around him he was some sort of lgbt because um you know he yeah, enjoyed the company was, of i wasn't sure if that was a rumor about him or if it was a true thing or not uh it, it, it's a it's it's difficult to ascertain i think that he probably was maybe like, i don't know or at least we bis maybe bisexual the, the, at the most at least maybe because yeah plus, plus he just had sex with his wife just because it was required of him yeah maybe but piers gaviston and then later hugh dispenser the younger yeah uh so the problem is, is that when you have a close confidant when you have a close inner circle and you have a and you're weak you just lost a war in scotland um and you and your wife don't get on very well you guys don't like each other yeah uh the barons and earls and all of that will get very upset with you <laughs> and try to at least uh, get those people out of power. This happens earlier with Piers Gaveston. And then you get the Dispenser War, which they're trying to get Hugh Dispenser out of the government. Uh, and one of the major people that does this, uh, that leads this, is Roger Mortimer, the first Earl of March. He holds a lot of power, not only in the Welsh marches, but in Ireland as well. Now we're fast. Mortimer, that that last name sounds like like we talked about. I heard it before somewhere. Besides this here, yeah, I I think that this fam this family is actually uh pretty uh well entrenched. Um, there were probably some in the uh, Wars of the Roses. Okay. Um, I think there was an Anne Mortimer, maybe yeah, in the Wars of the Roses. But Roger Mortimer, he was one of the most powerful marcher lords. He had a lot of money. Uh, he gets imprisoned in the Tower of London. Isabella is angry. She goes to her dad in France. Was it her dad? I don't know. <laughs> she goes to... Either her dad or her, this time maybe her brother, one of her brothers. Yeah, one of those. Uh, she goes down there to try and be like, hey, come help me against my husband because I don't like him very much. Roger ends up getting out of the Tower of London, fleeing to France, hooking up with Isabella, becoming lovers, and then they go back. In 1327, they come back. Edward II was deposed. They did horrible, horrible, horrible things to him, including sticking a hot... uh hot spike in his um yeah uh <laughs> to mock his assumed homosexuality and edward the third who was only 14 years old at this point becomes monarch and because of that well uh roger yeah monarch by parents he, i guess he was a, i guess he at the time he, he, he considered young enough to roll on his own so he had to have supervision yeah. still yeah, Roger Mortimer becomes uh, the 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 de facto uh, monarch in all but name during this time. Uh, so the next slide would probably be good. Right. So Ro Roger Mortimer is essentially the the, mo the the real power behind the throne at this point. And so the early part of Edward III's reign is going to be attempting to take the throne back. And part of this, Roger Mortimer essentially used his power to acquire estates and titles throughout England and Ireland and probably set up his descendants pretty well, but... This end up. This would end up. You know, he wouldn't be there much longer. Uh, until, Edward of Woods. Until he got, till Edward the Third got of, 
age at least. Uh, yeah, he actually, I'm pretty sure back in the day, you, uh, your seniority would actually be not too far after 14. So the fact that, so the fact that, uh, so the fact that Roger kept control for as long as he did was kind of proof, you know, that, that he wasn't in it for good intentions. Uh, the beginning of his downfall occurs in a war against Scotland. Okay. Uh, oh, the battle is... So, so uh, like the guy who he plays, he also did bad in Scotland. Yes, he also did bad in Scotland. He lost the Battle of Stanhope Park and had to give up actual large amounts of territory in the north of England, which um, Edward was not a big fan of. And Edward is essentially, essentially trying at this point to find, how am I going to do this? How am I going to take power? This is the first crack. And the second crack comes in 1330, the Battle of Stanhope. Park is in 1327, um, but hit his wife. I think Philippa of I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah Philip. I think Phil, I, Philippa sounds right. The last name I can't really pronounce that well. Uh, they end up having Edward of Woodstock, who would eventually get the coolest name. In English history, the Black Prince. The Black Prince. In 1330, he is born. Edward and a couple of his mates, his chums, uh, go up to Nottingham Ca Castle and capture uh, Mortimer and execute him. So now Edward will be in power in his own name now. He also sidelines Isabella, I think. Yeah, it, yeah, uh, but unlike his, is. yeah, but like, unlike unlike Roger, I don't think he actually, I don't think he executes his his mom uh, either, because he because he's world here himself, and I guess he like kind of likes his yeah. mom, I guess. But the stepfather, <laughs> no, he he's gone, he's dead. I'm pretty sure Isabella. I'm pretty sure Isabella pushes him pretty hard to try and uh conquer france later yeah she dies in 1358 so she's around for a while okay but like i said i guess yeah but still he doesn't probably like, unlike his stepfather he's probably like, actually kill his own mother yeah um so now he has to set now he has to ensure that the instability that has happened not only under his father but his uh grandfather and Past that, his great grandfather with the barons doesn't happen. Yeah, and this and picture right here is him taking, killing, or, ca or capturing Roger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the next slide will get into his policies to try and. Uh, so, really quick, it's imp one of the things that got knocked into my head, there were two things that my professors at university wouldn't let me do. The one was call it, uh, any group of people a tribe. He'd always say call them nation. And the second was do not synonymize nation and state. This is a rather uh, modern concept. At the time, there was no idea. There, there was no idea of the nation state. Nation just meant a group of people who are culturally, linguistically, and historically related to each other. So you do get the beginnings of an English national identity, but you've got a couple of centuries down the line until you have a, uh, the English like the, nation state, like like the eighteen hundreds after Napoleon stuff. Yeah, Napoleon, uh, Napoleon, and the French Revolution. These are seen as the advent of the nation state. Yeah. So, but like when again, I'm talking, 
but that's a that's a domino way down the line from this point. Yeah. So when I'm talking about this, don't think of this in the in the modern idea of a nation. This is just setting up an identity for them all to look at as he's going to start planning to move against France. So in so he used new peerages. Peerages is essentially um you know, landed titles, earls, dukes. I don't no bar, barons are a part of it. Yeah. Uh, so to consolidate the nobility around him, essentially, uh, give close confidants and uh, people he grew up around, give them titles like earls and stuff. Earls would be above the baron. So and make sure that. But the dukes were for, like, for his kids or his brothers, probably. But yeah, the, there were the, no the, dukes oh. in England before this point. But you he decides was the king himself was a duke, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In France there were dukes, but there were no dukes in uh France. I think I it's mean, because, not France. I, I'm guessing I'm, I'm just guessing here is because under the dukes were the barons, and when the Duke of Duke of Normandy brought his barons up, he brought them up to the um land up there. So that, so that's why they were very well, yeah, this, this was part of uh, William's plan to ensure that no one man could challenge for the throne. Uh, don't have higher uh, titles of nobility because they usually hold would hold multiple earls underneath them and multiple barons underneath them. That would yeah. be that wouldn't be loyal to the king, but would be loyal to the duke. So that was part of that. However, Edward's plan was to make close relatives of the king into dukes. They will thus be uh, loyal to the monarch as what's good for the monarch is what's good for the family. That's his thinking. And to further ensure that there isn't that the loyalty isn't towards the duke, in a sense, and try to make sure that the loyalty is to the state and to the monarch. He creates the Order of the Garter, which is still used today. Um, uh, it's just it's just like a club for the mo uh, for the uh, nobility, essentially. He actually thought about uh, reviving the Knights of the Round Table, as well. Well, quote unquote reviving, um, but. He decided not to because he thought that it would be uh, the way he was, the way war was at the time was not seen as chivalrous. So he didn't want to have too much association with chivalry and his court. And he actually starts using, he, he actually starts having literary languages, you, uh, um, not literary. English used as a literary language and being used in the government. Now that does not mean that that does not mean that uh, it was the dominant. They still used Norman Fr uh, French or Anglo Norman mostly, but you do start seeing uh, his grandson will eventually be the first uh, monarch to go out and talk to talk to people in English. Talk to the, to, talk to the little people, the peasants. Yeah, the peasants during the peasants' no, but, revolt. But basically, the, the kings were, were more bilingual, a little bit more more French, I guess, because that's the nobility language. Then, slowly started to go to more English at this this point. Yeah, yeah, try because he's trying. He's going to be gunning for the throne of France, so he's going to be at war with France, and he wants to set the English apart from the french people this is this is the beginning of the english national identity is we aren't french we're english which is kind of weird seeing as your nobility and your monarch are all descended from Fran french people but you know uh people <laughs> don't really think that hard especially when they're toiling fields um and fighting in wars uh so this is all for the next slide. Yeah. Be Everyone, if, if more of this, go check out my last year's episode of, of Languages I did with Dapper Dino. 
we kind of went to the English language history a little bit down there. Oh, that actually reminds me. Um, the lords of England would not be speaking French. Uh, the, they'd be speaking the dialect from Normandy. Uh, from that's Norman? why... Yeah, old, old, uh, Norman French. Because uh, there's some words that have come into English like cavalry and stuff that wouldn't make that wouldn't make sense if it came from Parisian French yeah but it does make sense if it comes through Norman so kind of like kind of like Viking French almost yeah uh, yeah uh there's since some of the, that it, since kind of the, Normandy was was originally like a, a a reward for the Vikings to say you you come here at, at, from a history <laughs> You stay here and and fight off your cousins uh, up in Scandinavia. Yeah, stop see, stop besieging Paris. Leave us alone. <laughs> yeah, you're uh, border guards so, now. <laughs> yeah, um. So Isabella, of course, is his mom, who is the grandson of Philip the Fourth. Yeah, or the daughter of Philip the Fourth. Yeah, yeah. What did I say? I, I'm it's, sorry. It's not, it's <laughs> oh, whoops. Uh, we live in the modern age. People can be... Uh, <laughs> Moms can be sons at the same time. I don't know. Uh, so, you uh, throughout history, you have this struggle between the fact that not only are the English monarchs monarchs in their own right, yeah. but they also have to pay homage to the French monarch. And a problem occurs when the last of the direct, yeah, they're la called the the direct Capetians. Yeah, the the last um, of the uh, uh, when all of uh, Isabella's brothers died, and they had no descendants of their own. Yeah, um, uh, they're called the direct Capetians because they're direct descendants, uh, father son, father son, father son, to Hugh Capet, the first uh, Capetian king of France. Uh, so now you have this, you you have this other, um, the, yeah, the like House of second, Valois. Second or third, first, second, second, third cousin. I forget how, how, yeah. how far back it went. If you want to look at a confusing family tree, look at the family tree of the monarchs of France. It's confusing. Yeah, I, 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 ha I have, I have, I have a, I have a, I have a little list a long time ago in an ancestry.com. I made a little list. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It's, it's incredibly confusing, but the Valois. Uh, Philip the Sixth uh, becomes the first Valois monarch. Um, yeah, um, and Ed, Edward III's like, wait a minute, I'm 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 more interested than, than you are. <laughs> well, it more comes out of the fact that Philip the Sixth is coming to Edward and saying, if you don't pay me homage for Aquitaine and Ponthieu, which is that big, what color is that? Like a grayish yellow brown kind of thing. Uh, that's all. Ed, that's Edward the Third's land right there. If you don't pay me homage for that land, I'm gonna take it. So he he goes and he takes it, and Edward the Third was not having it. He's like, my mom is the daughter of Philip the Fourth. I'm closer. I'm closer to him than you are. I'm gonna take the French throne, <laughs> which, yeah, now Sigma it, move right there. Yeah, well, here it's I've I've heard I've heard uh, th this point I've heard different stories about this that before this they may or may not they 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 may have already had the you can't have female descendant line here or it might have happened because of this. Uh, so this comes to down to um. So the nobility of France does not want the king of England to be king of France. So technically, that rule was not a thing beforehand. The okay. Capetians were not direct descendants of the Carolingians, and the Carolingians were not direct descendants of the Merovingians either. So, uh, But the nobility of France, and the Hundred Years' War is actually a very important thing when it comes to the national identity of both France and England in making them... Uh, distinct and separate nations um 
the nobility was like, nah, -uh. I don't want to be a part of, I don't want to be, I don't want to have Edward the third be my monarch. So they are the ones that decide, you know, this law that comes all the way back in the 500s, the Salic law says women can inherit the throne and yeah. people through the women's line can't inherit the throne. Nah. -uh. So that was so, a thing to, not that because of this thing, not be, not like oh, this has always been a thing. No, so this is, you're saying it started because of this claim. Yeah, this start. It started when they put Philip the Sixth in, but they put it, Philip the Sixth in because they didn't want Edward the Third, and Edward the Third was like, okay, uh, it, it was a whole thing leading up to this, and so but yeah, the get, Edward the Third didn't care that much until his land got taken away. Yeah, and I'm I'm pretty sure Isabella actually urges him on to try to take the French throne, uh, the motherly wants, I guess. And so there's uh, the Hundred Years' War. That is a deceptive title, as with the Wars of the Roses. It's multiple different conflicts set into one. Like Edward the first, III and later Henry V and VI. Uh, oh, yeah. This goes through multiple different monarchs. This goes through Edward the Third, Richard the Second. Henry the Fourth, Henry the Fifth, Henry the Sixth, five monarchs. Wait, did Edward the Fourth? Edward the Fourth might even Edward the Fourth. I think maybe I think maybe but I think Edward the Fourth was more concerned. Edward the Fourth. I mean, yeah, Edward, Henry the Fourth might be, might have been more concerned about claiming his own throne in England with the Henry the Third than he was with a France. Probably, I'm thinking maybe. Yeah, the official end is 1453 of the Hundred Years' Wars, if I'm not... Oh, wait, no, that might just be the fall of Constantinople. I gotta... Yep, I think, yeah, Constantinople fell like 14, 1456 too, yeah. Yes, it was 1453. Yes. I was right. Nice! Yeah. So going back to earlier with the whole problem with the uh, Knights of the Round Table, the early the early combat in the War Hundred Years War was these thing called chevauchets. These were just massive raiding parties that would go in and just absolutely destroy the countryside, rape, pillage, all of yeah. that stuff. And this is like the like, I think you said. Uh, uh, have you ever did you ever watched the no Zach or not? Did you ever watch the extra credits or the hundred year hundred hundred year war series? No, I I watched the uh, kings and generals one. Okay, you, you, that was pretty good. They had yeah. this thing about how it was the English longbowmen versus the the knights of France, and oh yeah. Um, there was also that that led into the fact that he didn't want to have the Knights of the Round Table as well. This this whole <laughs> and the, the first time this really shows itself is at the Battle of Crecy, um, between Philip the Sixth and uh, Edward the Third. They fight essentially, and the English longbowmen just absolutely destroy the knights, and this is like an early showing of how good ranged combat can be better than close combat. If you, if you're trained enough and you start getting uh, English uh, peasantry being forced to uh, train every single day, stuff like that, insane stuff. Um, Yes, the wacky Plantagenets. <laughs> yeah, uh, Edward the Third ultimately wasn't like he. His son was the big star of the war early on. Uh, Ed Edward of Woodstock, the Black Prince, he um, led what was called the Grand Chevauchet, in and. If you watch the Kings and Generals video, he just absolutely... Wait, that was Hitch History Marsh, actually. History Marsh. Yeah, so many history channels There's now. A... Uh, don't end up, you start. Yeah. yeah, 
there's, there's better history channels now, history channels on YouTube. Than there, there is an actual history channel now on cable. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, wait. Are you, are you telling me ancient aliens aren't real? Come on. <laughs> well, it might be real, but <laughs> I can only talk about it so many times before it gets boring. <laughs> You, you can't you can't tell me Puma Punku was made by people. <laughs> but, but uh Yeah, between the ancient aliens and the pawn shop stars, you know, on History Channel. Yeah. Uh but beforehand it was just like World War II the channel, but you know. Man, that's better than than the pyramids were built by aliens, yeah. in my opinion. <laughs> but yeah. Um so, so, like, so Edward the Third's like, no, nope, like, oh, oh he says, says, yeah, the map insert is revealing how easy it is for England monarch to think of themselves as French but with British property. Uh, yeah, that kind of actually starts going away with Edward the Third. He, because uh, the slide earlier, it looks like you just the 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 beginning of the national identity stuff. Yeah. But yes, uh, it was definitely early on. The English monarchs definitely did think of themselves more as like French people that owned land in France. Famously, Richard the First only spent like a couple of weeks in England, and then he just left because <laughs> he was he was he was crusade he was a crusader. Uh, yeah. Here, and Jerusalem to fight uh what's it, what was it? Saladin. Was it Saladin? Yeah. Saladin, yeah. S Saladin. And uh he ended up uh dying in France at fighting fighting I think against rebellious lords. Uh but yes, during this entire thing you have the Black Death, which is actually extre like extremely important for later periods and for what I think is actually Far more, far more important about Edward III's reign than the wars he was in or the things that he did with dukedoms. The power of the House of Commons, uh, the power of Parliament grows during this period because of it. Because you actually have a massive shortage in labor. Uh, uh, a third of the country died. A couple of the royal family died. Um, as kids, I think. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's my head cannon now. <laughs> um, now, let's talk this. Was 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 the, the Black Prince inducted the Black Death or something else? I don't think so. I think it had something to do with his armor. Okay, I, I was I said I was wondering if it happened at the same time. Like, was he died was that because he was the Black he died with the Black Death or something? Or I I I need to know now. Okay, I feel like uh. Yeah, I don't know. I can't okay. find it quick. I was just wondering about that because you know, Black Prince, Black Death, name it, match. It might have something to do with the Grand Chevauchet, maybe. I'm not completely sure, but because of the shortage in, in labor and rise in wages, uh, he had to essentially try to. Uh, Oh, nice! I didn't oh, know. Oh, that yeah, this James is James Downer. You, you found something. Uh, James Downer. Just... Oh. But what were you gonna say? Sorry. Yeah, I, I think it was. I was but this time since there were less peasants on the thing after the Black Death. They were, they were this time. They were like, "Hey, you know, so there's less of us. Why don't you start paying us more for for stuff?" Instead of, yeah, instead of like, yeah. It's, it's a, this was like the maybe the the at least in England at least it was the, it was the, it was the downfall of the serfdom and then more uh, not, mean, not downfall still... per se but you know it takes a little bit but yes it, it does 
ultimately do that. But uh, in an attempt to try and solve this problem, he sets up the statute of laborers. And one of the <laughs> interesting things I read was <laughs> he essentially tried to uh, legislate out supply and demand. <laughs> so it was designed to fail. And it does fail after. I'm pretty sure it's what sets off the peasants' revolt. The revolt. All right, I'll 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 look that up. But uh, so of course you're fighting a war during the Black Death. That's not very fun. Uh, but the next thing, taxation. So did th this uh, did 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 the Black Death in Edward the Third's part of the war, the Hundred Year War? The, no, they, I'm pretty sure they had, uh, um, so, one second, 100, because you have the first, uh, Edwardian phase, and then you have the Breton, uh, succession crisis, I can't remember, let me, so the Edwardian phase is 1337 to 1360, which actually, uh, they're just chucking through. Uh, just chugging through okay the black death during this time um and then later on you'd get the war of the breton succession okay I, okay yeah i wasn't sure if if that the black death ended his campaign then later on his grandson great grandson henry the fifth picked it up later on oh no 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 uh yeah no this thing the hundred years war you have fighting throughout every every single king after Edward the Third until Henry the Sixth. Yeah, no one would, would let a mere play. In. <laughs> Who cares if people are dying? They're going to die really in war anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's not like uh, medieval armies were that big anyway. Um, they weren't that big. But yeah, taxation. This is where. Parliament gets a lot of political power for a little bit, but they use this political power later on to essentially say to the Tudors, hey, you can work with us and you can bypass the nobility. But, of course, if you're fighting a big war in France and if you're dealing with plague in the countryside, you need taxes. And Magna Carta had already set up the system uh, during Henry III's reign that he had to call a parliament to establish taxation. There was a little bit of a struggle between Henry III and the, uh, the lords about this. But Edward I is like, actually, this is a great way to get them to get the nobles on my side. So that I can wield the entirety of the English state against Scotland and France and Wales. So the the House of Commons started coming in, and because of this new expansion of powers, you get the creation of different procedures. Uh, the beginning of impeachment. And the office of the Speaker of the Commons. And that, would that be the later the Prime Minister? Came the Prime Minister later? No, the Speaker is still. Uh, have you ever watched um, uh, British, parliamentary? Are, stuff? Yeah, they, are, they, they you they, have. They, they they they're more open to arguing than than our our, our system of government is. Well, the, the the Speaker is the guy that goes order order. <laughs> he, he's oh. that guy. It's, he uh, essentially the same thing as the Speaker of the House here, except okay. he doesn't hold as much political power. Oh, uh, then, then what's the Prime Minister then? The Prime Minister, it, it it's the Prime Minister comes from. So he is the leader of the. Okay, how am I going to explain this? Okay, so. In Parliament, you have different parties. 
Okay. Yeah. You have the conservative party, the labor party, the liberal Democrats. Uh, the prime minister is at first the person who can wield the most votes in his favor in, in the house of commons. Okay. Uh, and now it's the leader of the party that has the most. But this is not. Um, this is different from the speaker than here, there. Yeah. Back then. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the first prime minister that is generally, yeah, yeah, the head of the majority party. I think they do actually have to be a member of parliament, though. They have to. Uh, I know early on you could be in the House of Lords and not in the House of Commons, but uh, now I think with uh, liberalization and stuff, it, it's essentially you have to be uh, in the House of Commons and be an um, MP. So, um, so, so probably, probably no Whigs or Tories anymore, t Whigs party anymore, <laughs> or whatever that was. Uh, th well, the Whig party. Um, is the ancestor of the modern liberal Democrats. Okay. The Labor Party became uh, more important oh. uh, in the early 20th century. And the conservatives are still called the Tories, but they're not the, uh, they're not the same Tories as beforehand. So what, but, so, so kind of like how our, our party changed from the Federalist, anti-Federalist, Republicans, all of them, the Whigs, to, are now that the English political system changed too throughout the years. Yeah, 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 uh, definitely. Um, the Labor Party actually um, starts with uh, Marx, a Marxian sense of economics. That uh, yeah. essentially was it, was it the during the was it during the Stuart reign that. The prime minister came more of a power thing. Uh, the first ever prime minister that is uh, accepted by all English historians was uh, oh my gosh, how am I going to forget his name? How am I going to forget his name? Why am I doing this? It was during the reign of jo of one of the Georges. Okay, the Hanoverians then. The Hanoverians, yeah. Why am I forgetting his name? No. Uh, before that, the Chancellor of the Exchequer was Sir Robert Walpole. Oh, I have no, I heard about Walpole before. Yeah, Sir Robert Walpole is the first person that is seen as the very. And that was that was the beginning. That the, that was the, at the end of the Stuarts, beginning of the Hanovers. During I, I again. I, you should watch this. You should watch this part of um, the history 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 show. It it talked about the uh, South Sea bubble. Yeah, yeah, that thing. Yeah, the South Sea bubble. One of the first like uh, capitalist uh, economic crises. Yeah. Want to um, buy some stock in this in this thing that doesn't exist? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, but uh, you do get the beginnings of the Tories and the Whigs, I think, during the Stuarts. Uh, the Tories were the people who supported, uh, uh, were the ones who supported the king, and the Whigs were the ones that didn't support the king. And that's actually why the Whig Party in American history gets its yeah. name, because they like, always like okay. characterizing Andrew J Jackson as a monarch yeah like like one side supported like the uh the cr the cr the Cromwell rebellion and the other one didn't uh yeah essentially uh and later, it, it maybe became... later on one side supported the Hanover the Hanoverians because they were proud the other side was like no no James James the second son still uh, the, the, the Jacobites were more more of a thing than the uh, other people yeah, and it also came down to uh, did you support the Glorious Revolution or not, or stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, because I'm pretty sure it became a pro, uh, it became a problem 
that uh, some people didn't want to take – some prime ministers didn't want to take titles because if they did, they couldn't be prime minister anymore. They could oh, only be a member of cabinet. Oh, because like uh, the, the House of Lords, House of Commons division thing? Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure – I don't know. They might have taken they might have made it so that you can't be in the House of Lords and be in the cabinet anymore. I'm not yeah. sure. Um, and, and CRJ, you said you you have much to talk about here. You, here you are popping up in the channel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The Whigs, uh the Whig Party in America got its name because they essentially were like, Andrew Jackson's gonna be a king, you know. Uh we're gonna be anti Andrew Jackson. And that was essentially all that held the Whigs together because and, they all had different ideas and, on slavery and, still, and stuff. I get we're off topic of the end of the third, but still, I think was the Whigs the beginning of the later on the early Republican Party under Abraham Lincoln? Was that the precursor to that, or was that different altogether? Parts of it. Par, uh, parts of it would join the. Democrats. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know we're not. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, w the Whigs and the uh, the Know Nothing Party, they'd come together to become the Republicans. And that 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 people talk about the party switch. But one thing that did not switch between the parties is that the Democrats have usually been uh, after the Civil War, at least uh, pro immigration while the republicans are usually anti-immigration and that's because of the know nothing party which is also known as the american party they were essentially like we don't like immigrants so that's gonna be and to, to learn about. more about that you can, you can check out last year's episode of, of me and rj talking about the political party system although if i'm wrong about any of that please uh rj yep let me know i'll, I'll have that up there in the the cards up up above Somewhere, somewhere, you can you can watch that video and the, click that card right there. All right, so right, music in. So have we got through this slide yet? No. Uh, so you actually get increased political awareness amongst the people that uh, were a part of Parliament and who would send the delegations to Parliament. Um, and this is because. The king had to prove the necessity of the tax, it, uh, the taxes that he was raising, and that it would benefit the community. That, not just the community as a whole, uh, not just uh, the communities as a whole in England, but their community. So, some decent, uh, some essentially. Movements towards what is today Parliament. And this is actually what I find to be some of the most important things that Edward III, while he's not directly a part of it, this is some of the most important social changes that were going on during this time. Yeah, the Hundred Years' War is cool to talk about. The battles like Crecy and Poitiers, they're fun to talk about. Later on, Henry V's battles of uh, Agincourt, they're fun to talk about. But that's different. That, that, that's, that's, that, that's a different episode in the future. But my bread and butter is social history, and this is this is the beginnings of like Parliament and that social movement towards more political awareness, uh, more political involvement from a new class that will become important. That will help. Yes. That would help the the tutors keep power because if if you're noticing uh, the way that Edward the Third has set up the kingdom is what's going to s essentially set off the Wars of the Roses. And now the tutors, when they come to power, not only do they have to find allies against the nobility in order to cement their reign, they go to this new landed gentry that's just underneath the barons and the aristocracy, these people who have been gaining power because of the uh, Black Death and this increased role of parliament, they go to them and the church for their power. 
So that's how that's how we're able to. Get, that's how England is able to get out of. Um, uh, this is how they're able to get out from the problems of the Wars of the Roses, essentially, and the problems of the nobility uh, during the Tudors. Yeah. Increased blood awareness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the Tudors. What Henry the Seventh, uh, from what RJ is saying, Henry the Seventh was a very fiscally aware monarch. He, um, he essentially wanted to ensure that his, uh, his lands that he owned, and one of the most important, yeah, they did lose a lot of power in the Black Death times, uh, but. Uh, the Duchy of Lancaster actually, uh, it, this is why it got merged back in with the uh, English uh, monarchs. The Duchy of Lancaster is an extremely wealthy land, and that was also the backbone of Tudor power. But again, we're going off on it on a different thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like so, but, so, so, so we do on this on this show. <laughs> we have a topic that we. That, that's the thing about history too. Everything's connected somehow. It's all brand, domino branched off each other until this big web of mess we call history. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's part of what I I like about it, but it yeah. it, 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 it ain't as it, it ain't as. History isn't as uh, what's the word uh, nice and tidy like like math is, or maybe even some science. I guess science is kind of nissy too. But <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it is not. Once you get into it, it's like it's really hard to talk about. And that's probably something I need to get better at. Uh, it's hard to focus down on what you're trying to talk about because it all ends up going somewhere else. Yeah, that, that's why what ifs are kind of hard to do because you know so many branching parts of that the, uh, other history that develop each other. It's hard to pick out what one thing changing will affect something else down the line because you know so so many different layers of stuff. Yeah, uh, there are some people that do what ifs in a way that I don't like. What ifs are only good for understanding why things happened the way they were. And they're they're fun too, but some people just want to be like, "What if the Nazis won?" You know, some dumb stuff like that. I don't know. And uh, alternate history hub is actually really good about that. He says that yeah, uh, it's more important that we know why things happen, and these thought yeah. experiments kind of help with that. Yeah, and he, and, he's, and he also also he, uh, I, I watch that too because he also says the the, the further back you go, the harder it is to pinpoint things. Other stuff happens too. Yeah. So. Yeah, because like, the butterfly effect. So the political order that Edward the Third set up in his later reign uh, starts to. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, it starts to uh, immediately break down as he gets older. The nobility that used to be his uh, backbone. Uh, that used to be his backbone that allowed him to project so much power into France. Uh, they're dying, and now we have a new nobility that is more uh, loyal to the princes, creating essentially infighting between the nobility. So already, the stuff that he tried to do in order to try to fix the problems with English feudalism or feudalism in general they're already falling apart by the end of his reign. And he starts listening to uh, more com like confidants. You know how Edward II end ends up falling because of his confidants? He has a mistress. I forget her name. But uh, she becomes extremely powerful. And this is also where Parliament gets a little bit of its power as well. Because in 1376, they came to accept taxes, but instead they just sat there and were like, we don't like this, 
we don't like this. We don't like this. The king's favorites were removed from power. And this is one of the first showings of that uh, impeachment power that parliament had been gaining because of the increased need for taxation and uh, the Black Death. Uh, yeah, I guess hundred was also was maybe uh, Edward the Third distracted with his with his war in France too. So maybe he, either he he let the people the public getting this power, or he didn't notice it. He was getting the power. Uh, well, uh, a new king in France comes up, uh, and this begins the Caroline phase of the war, and you start getting um, setbacks, and a lot of the land that um, Edward III controlled before the war, he's now losing that land, and he's losing what he's gained from these wars. And he he lives so long, he, he outlives his own son, Uh the Black Prince. By a by year. <laughs> by a year, yeah. Uh, then he dies in 1377. And now the the throne passes on to Richard II. I can't remember if he's a kid when he... Yeah, gets... I think he was 12. Yeah. I, I, think, I so, think we talked about that. I think we talked about that in The War of the Roses. He, he... Yes, because it, it is... It is really important because whenever you have a strong nobility and a weak monarch, it's not very good when it comes down to the power of the monarch is going to be able to levy. Uh, Henry the Third was lucky that he had a, an amazing son in Edward the First. Yeah, um, yeah. Henry the Henry the Henry the, II, Henry the Third was also one of the third third young. T he he also became the king when he was young too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think I think that's I think that's, I think that's one of the reasons that people like, even though you don't think he's that great, that people some people like Edward the Third because because he, he was one of the few, I think he, I think he was one of the few exceptions that that started became a young king and still got stronger, and, I guess, yeah. instead of weaker. Yeah, uh, um, he actually died an extremely popular king. Uh, that earlier problem with Parliament, Parliament didn't wasn't saying this is Edward the third's fault. This is his uh, close confidence fault. They're the ones that are doing this to the kingdom, not Edward. Cause they loved Edward. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, he was a pretty impulsive person. And I think that would lead to a lot of problems uh, with his system failing because he's trying to get it all set up in time. He's not he's not king for that long before he starts with his war in France. And from that point on, it's almost constant war. You are dealing with the Black Death. And ultimately, giving your, <laughs> giving your sons duchies, which now have power over multiple earls, which now has... It essentially leads to the problems that come up during Richard II's reign and why he eventually gets overthrown by Henry Bolingbroke yeah. and the beginning and, of the House of Lancaster. Yeah, if you want to talk hear more about that, uh, right up here, if you point the right direction, we're gonna have, I'll have the card up for the War of, a Rose, a War of the Roses episode. So right. well, while in the short term, it gave him the necessary political capital to, in order to go to war with France, it ends up coming to bite his descendants in the ass, essentially. Yeah. Sorry, can I cuss? Oh, no. Yeah, I don't have that. I don't, I, I'm not uh, monetized. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, having... So, essentially... That's my main problem with Edward the Third. Well, yes, exactly, RJ, right here. Yes, that is the that is the biggest flaw with monarchy, and it's a flaw that continues to uh, be a problem with England throughout throughout. Uh, 
it's time, especially the Stewarts. The Stewarts, one of the worst dynasties, in my opinion, that ever. That, that's ruled. me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> just, just because, you know, <laughs> they wanted to be absolute rulers, but the English people, they were like, eh, at the time, at the, at this, if it, maybe if this was still France, they could do that. But it, this, by this point, England was like, like no, we've we've beyond that at this point. Yeah, we we <laughs> we're just gonna chop your head off, dude. Like, stop it. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, the statue. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Maybe plus the Catholic thing might have a thing to deal with too. <laughs> uh, yeah, secret Catholics, secret Catholics. At least until James, until they became open Catholics. <laughs> until James II, yeah. yeah. Uh, Charles the First was a suspected Catholic. Car- Charles the Second uh, was baptized as a Catholic on his deathbed. Yeah, I think that, that's that allegedly. Th- that, that was the thing I can talk about, that I read about that James the Fir- James the First slash six did that he married yeah. he married his son to a Catholic monarch and he married his daughter to a Protestant, Protestant monarch or Protestant rule or not monarch but to have both feet in the party both feet in the in the, in the yeah. swamp yeah like his daughter became married to the later on the the elect, elector the elector of palestine or pal uh, the palatinate palatinate and that that later became the 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 hanover ancestor and then his son became married henrietta and that was the catholic the catholic side uh yeah, um, and then yeah, that statute of laborers, of course, fails because you're trying to legislate out supply and demand, which is like <laughs> impossible, and the peasants weren't very happy. And again, the increased power of parliament, and in order for a king to be a great king, in my opinion, you have to have a good legacy. Monarchs like Alfred the Great, they're great because they set up a legacy that lasted for a long time and did good things for the, the people. Most of the legacy of uh, Edward III actually ends in failure, and the gr- the biggest thing, in my opinion, that happens, that, this is my opinion on the parliament thing being the greatest thing, it isn't even him, isn't even uh, his active doing. It was just the necessity of the time and more of a uh what what would that be called oh man i'm sorry i've been up since 2 a.m i'm sorry (laughs) words don't come very good to me right now but yeah uh he didn't actively do it it was just a consequence there it was a consequence of his actions so the fact that the Wars of the Roses happened right after him, uh, he was he was he wasn't that bad of a monarch. He was pretty good. He was a good uh, general, but greatest one of the greatest. No, I'm sorry, no, not for me. So, so who is your who is your greatest uh, English ruler then? <sighs> It's really tough. It's really tough, but I think it comes comes down to Alfred the Great. Ah, uh, like te- technically Edward the Third's ancestor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, Alfred the Great, essentially, he wasn't even actually a king of he, England. He, he was he, 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 Wessex, but yeah, but but his descendants later beyond his descendants later became the English, but. The thing, the pol- his policies ensured that England would be what it is yeah. throughout the Anglo-Saxon period. Yeah, I think I think it's direct, the direct descendant between Edward the th- Ed, Ed, Alfred the Great and Edward the Confessor it was a direct line almost. Uh, I don't think Edward the Confessor had kids. And that, but, but I mean, but oh no. yeah 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 yeah. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, I, I don't know. It just got me livid when someone said, "Oh, he's one of the greatest monarchs in English history." No, no. 
but I don't I don't normally rank monarchs. I don't actually think it's I mean it's it's it can be a little fun, but like yeah, that's a good idea for for a future episode. Tier tier charts of all the monarchs of, of Europe. Yeah, tier S charts are, are way easier. They're way easier than ranking them because it's always like, oh my god, how am I gonna decide between these two people who are extremely similar? Where am I gonna put them? Because <laughs> John John Lackland, uh, Edward the Second, Richard the Second. Where am I gonna put? How am I going to differentiate these people? They all have the same Louis problems. The fourteenth, Louis the sixteenth, the guy got, got his head chopped off. Oh, Louis the fourteenth. He's absolutely he. He's one of the better French monarchs. But Philip Augustus, he's the one for me. I'm sorry. Philip Augustus. Uh, if you're not count, if you're not counting uh, Charlemagne, of course. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, again, that's another topic altogether. Like how back then. Instead of inst Charlemagne, instead of instead of like giving uh, all your all your stuff to your oldest kids, like let's divide up between all our kids. Oh uh, yeah, Fr Frankish succession. Oh my goodness. Man. And thus began, and thus began the the rival between France and Germany that lasted to World War Two. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, you have the Holy Roman Empire and France feuding for a while too. They didn't they didn't like each other either. And that's the the predecessor of, uh, kind of, the predecessor of Germany. Yeah, like I said, history is complicated among a web of webs and layers among, among each other. Yeah, so, especially with what I said earlier, like the idea of the nation state wasn't a thing back then. What was Germany really, except for this land that? Yeah. Uh, what what they say the Holy, Holy Roman Empire was was not Holy Roman or an empire. Uh, okay. Uh, that, that's during Voltaire's say. time, Voltaire's time, definitely. Um, yeah. Otto the first, Holy Roman Empire is all th eh, arguably yeah. two, possibly three, <laughs> all three. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But even by the time of Charles V, that's kind of more of a not that great. <laughs> it's more of a yeah. Uh, it it's another uh, unlike England. Uh, it actually has very similar problems to England in the fact that uh, massive decentralization occurs because you keep giving lands to more and more sons because of that partition succession. Um, so you get more and more lords who are more and more invested in their own lands. And then you actually get uh, these interesting uh, creations of cities that do not want to uh, deal with the emperor. Uh, and they just want to do their own thing. And at this point, this point, it's more of a lip service than actual honor. Like yeah. Title. Yeah. But, the English were able to get past that, but uh, the Holy Roman Emperors weren't. Um, and that's later. That's probably later on why it, it fell after Napoleon later on became in Prussia took up in Prussia took up took up, took up the reins. And I think that would be like that's like an interesting question. Why did the Holy Roman Empire fail, but England? It's, it could be just because. You know, smaller landmass. I I don't know. Like I said, that's a that's a someone write a book. That's a topic for that's a, that's a, that's a topic for a another episode. All right. So what what have we learned today? Edward the Third is not the one of the greatest <laughs> monarchs in English history, but a lot of important things happened. Uh, he's one of those monarchs that you just have to talk about. Edward the First, great monarch, but you don't have to talk about him when it comes to the future. But Edward the Third, I think it's mostly because the Hundred Years' War happens. A lot yeah. of stuff can be uh, tied back to him for yeah. later stuff. That's yeah, kind why, of like, kind of like like some president, they might have been important in their time, 
but later on in history, no one really cares about them that much. Yeah, yeah. Like they might have uh, been... Ed... <laughs> Edward the First is mostly known for Bra- from Braveheart, Longshanks, you know, the the mean guy. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, he's a... And then you have other ones like William the Conqueror. These are, I don't know. They're just super important. All of the history after them, like expands out, and all the history before them, but they're super important. Just don't be the don't be like John Lackland, who's super important for the all the wrong reasons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, for a future episode. Is there is there any mark you want to talk about in the future of England or France or England, other other ones you want to talk about? That I'd be totally down with doing an entire like deep dive on the entire uh, English royalty. Although I uh, will not talk about Edward uh, the Sixth because he wasn't alive long enough. <laughs> Edward, the, Edward. He the he was one of the princes in the tower. Maybe Edward the Fifth. Edward the Fifth. Oh my God! So many. Yeah, Edward V. Uh, I will not talk about him. <laughs> I, think we, I think we talked about a little bit in the War of the Roses episode where he's like, the, um, his his uncle said he was technically a king because his his mommy was illegitimate or something like that. The marriage was illegitimate. Yeah, he the marriage was illegitimate. But yeah, then later, he, Henry the Seventh, re, re, Henry the Seventh, uh, reinstated him because he, he's the sister, he's the, he's the brother of, of his wife. So like. Yeah, so I was like, my, my wife is legitimate, so, so, so <laughs> my he, wife is legitimate, so Edward V is legitimate. But yeah, I'd I'd like to I I'd be fine with deep dives on all of yeah the monarchs. So that, that, that'd be a long that'd be a long episode if we do the entire thing from. Like, oh yeah, I was more talking about each one a different episode. Oh, okay, but, okay, okay. I think about all the way all the way from at Alfred the Great to Elizabeth the <laughs> Second. Yeah, yeah, every single one. And then we get to talk about Prince Andrew. Oh, yeah. Who's the, who's, what's this, what's the future monarch's name? The little babe? He's like, he's like maybe five or six now. I don't remember what That'd his be, name is, what? but I was more talking about the Duke of York. He's currently in a oh. lot of. Oh, I, I was talking about whoever, whatever. Prince William's kid's name is his three kids. Uh, I, oh God, okay. Um, I know Charlotte's his daughter. Prince William. Okay. His oh, that reminds first me son now. Is George. 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 Yeah, that reminds me now. Uh, they changed. They, they currently. I think they recently changed the law. Instead of the, the instead of the the first the first son becoming monarch, it's now whoever was born first. Daughter or daughter or son, instead of boys then girls. Oh it, yeah, I thought you were talking about like um, uh, seniority succession. No, no, yeah, 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 yeah. It is now. Now uh, it's boy, whoever was born first in the thing, instead of boys first then the girls next. Yeah, that's agnatic that, cognatic uh, primogeniture. That's another thing that England England had over France later on, especially with the. Edward the Third Sixth thing was is even though England might not have liked female rulers, they they, they, they had no problem going to the female line, get their get their kings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they did that a lot. But uh, also, the Windsors will continue. They are not going to be called Mountbatten's. They will continue to be Windsors. Because. <laughs> uh, for some reason, this time, the the female's name is going to be the name of the monarch. Yeah. After. And technically, they only became Windrush because of World War One, and they, they, before that, they were mm-hmm. German, some German Saxe-Coburg novel. Saxe-Coburg und Gotha. 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 Because of uh, Victoria's husband's name. Mm-hmm. Alfred. Yeah. All right. So, but okay. But in particular, is there any any, any English market you want to focus on or our next meeting, whatever that might be? Hmm. Huh. 
Henry the Seventh would be a good one. Uh, all right, that, that, that and that'd be cool. War of the Roses, Edward the Third prequel, Henry the Seventh the sequel. Yeah, 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 exactly. And the rise of the rise of a new aristocracy. Because Henry the Seventh is the ancestor of the the Tudors and the Stuarts too, because his his daughter was married married in the his daughter married James the Fourth. Yeah, yeah, and and then the nine oh uh, then the, the the nine also the ancestor of the nine day queen. Oh yeah, Lady Jane Grey, poor poor lady, poor lady. All right, but all right. Well, again. Thanks, thanks for being. Thanks for uh, only an hour and a half. Not not bad. Yeah. We'll set up a time for that. Thanks. Thanks for being on. Of course, of course. All right. And if any more comments, any you were that were late to the thing, uh, comment down below in the thing. Give us a thumb up. I say subscribe to him, but you, you don't have his own channel. I don't think. <laughs> no. But uh. I do actually want to talk about one thing, uh, the Tongan interruption. I think it's important that we uh, do everything we can to help the people of Tonga and Vanuatu. Uh, that big eruption that just happened caused a massive amount of destruction. Uh, I know there are some channels doing some... Uh, uh, there is a geology and science hub or something like that uh, that... Had a has a video on it, and he's doing, and he linked it to a, a charity that is going to be helping the people of Tonga in this uh, bad time, and talks about some of the stuff that's really bad about that. But uh, I hope anybody who watches this from Tonga, I hope you guys are okay, and I hope Tonga turns out fine. Me too. Uh but until we meet again, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. I'll see you next time. Out. Bye. If you just do it, it will turn out okay. Welcome for take two of this special episode of Talk Time with Caffeine. We tried two weeks ago. Our uh, issues failed miserably. After an hour, we just gave up. Mainly because it was time for it. It, VB had to, go to, had to go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's what happens when you work at like four in the morning. Yeah. And and plus that. Uh, I think you're different times when I am too also. So. Yeah. I live in Seattle. So. Uh, all right. But today we're trying again, and the topic is, is the, he corrected me last time, the Wars of the Roses. Yes. <laughs> it's, not just, it's not just one war. All right. Yep. All right. So at least in my head, I could be totally wrong. You know, even though the actual battles didn't begin until years later, but... I think it happened, the start, in my opinion at least, was when Henry the Fourth, future Henry the Fourth, overthrew his cousin, first cousin Richard the Second. But the problem was there, it, he was a little bit lower on the a totem pole biologically of Henry, of Henry the, Richard, of Henry the Third's descendants. Like he was like the third or fourth kid. So he, he bypassed totally the second or third second kid, totally second or third kid. He, he bypassed them, which at the time no one like really, I guess cared about that much since since him and his kid Henry the Henry the Fifth were awesome war people winning the wars winning winning down in France. So no one cared. But then when his son Henry the Sixth came wrong, people start caring <laughs> that, that maybe that line of success had been jumped a little bit. Yeah, uh, the line was supposed to go through the. Uh... The Dukes of York. Um, he he had a right of succession through the Duchy of York, and I think a diff a different son of Edward the Third. I can't remember which one. Oh man, 
but yeah, uh, the Dukes of York, uh, eventually Richard, Duke of York, who pretty much starts the war. Uh, yeah, but they they didn't really care because, yes, Henry V, the uh, star of England, went on to win uh, and make it so that Henry VI was technically the heir to the King of France. This is kind of like what, almost like what Edward III claimed too, because they're both were the descendants of a princess of France. Uh, yeah, but uh, Henry V was able to get the that then King of France to uh, recognize Henry VI. But of course, it doesn't end well for Henry VI. Yeah, well, Joan of Arc well, comes up and everything. Yeah, well, well, I hear voices in my head, lady. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I mean, the groundwork for the Wars of the Roses was laid down long before uh, Henry Bolingbroke, the name of Henry the Fourth, uh, takes the throne. I don't remember when that happened. I think it was like thirteen ninety nine. Uh. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, because that's when his father dies too. Uh, his father was a son of Edward the Third, John of Gaunt. Uh, the problems start with Edward the Third, in my opinion. Um, Edward the Third, essentially, is the guy who starts the Hundred Years' War. Essentially, he since John. England had been dealing with a problem of rebellious noblemen, you know? And and plus, since, well, John, since the time of William the Conqueror, the problem also was that the English kings were also, quote, quote, vassal to the king, French king from either dukes of, of Normandy or count of the June or count of Flanders, whatever they were, you know, they were all, they were, tech, they were technically vassals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, there's that. But in order to get his um, kingdom behind him, he there weren't any dukes before Edward III in England. Earl was the highest you could go. He creates a new class, and he makes it for his family members. Eventually his sons. Uh, uh, John of Gaunt. Oh, my gosh. I'm blanking on all the other names because... Essentially, he gives he. Edward, there's Edward, like Edward the Black Prince, the the, the, yes. the, the, the heir. Uh, yeah, John of Gaunt. Uh, yeah, if I can find that family tree I had earlier, I can see them all. Now, at least at least five sons that I'm aware of. Yeah, so he and, abor and Yeah, he apportions a large amounts of land to his sons, which at the time. Yeah, it made it so that the kingdom was united. There weren't any problems. He could uh, do his war in France. Uh, but it would come to bite him in the butt. Yeah. Well, especially, not him, the kingdom. <laughs> yeah, well, especially when uh, his heir died before him, leaving the only heir uh, at the time a kid. Yeah. Um, yeah, and... A big problem, well, Richard II was trying to wrest control from his cousins, essentially, from the powerful landowners, and he was using certain landowners to uh, try and combat the other ones. There were a couple of rebellions under his reign. Uh, yeah. And wasn't, I, 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 I might be wrong about this, I'm being wrong, but wasn't, his uncle, the the father of Rich, uh, Henry the the fourth, originally one like one of his uh, uncle Tudor land, not, not uh, what's it called, um, uh, guardian people type people when he was, when he was still a kid. Uh, yeah, because John of Gaunt was a pretty good politician. That sounds right. But for some reason, he uh. <laughs> I think in 1398 he exiles Henry Henry Bolingbroke to Ireland, and then when John of Gaunt dies in 1399, he says that Henry the Fourth can't become Duke of Lancaster. So Henry the Fourth's rebellion is a, originally to uh, 
gain the Duchy of Lancaster that he sees as his birthright, and he eventually decides, eh, I'm going to just take the throne, I guess, you know? Why not? <laughs> always, a good, always a good option. Yeah. <laughs> but this is really an outgrowth of the Hundred Years' War, and Henry VI, uh, not a very strong king, just like Richard II, but he has an extra fault. Uh, Henry VI, in times of crisis, seemed to just shut down and stop, just stop responding to everything. He kind of, yes, Edmund of Langley, yes. So Richard, Duke of York, he has descent through Lionel of Clarence and Edmund of Langley. Yeah. Yeah, the Edmund of Langley one is for the, I guess the claim came from technically it's not the, the third son, but I guess once you marry your your aunt or, or uncle, great uncle, or however the thing is, like that line jumped ahead. A lot of, yeah, yeah, it yeah it's uh it's not Probably as not bad as the Hasburgs <laughs> as William the Third and Mary the Second who were first cousins. I'm pretty sure marrying yeah. I, I could say the Hasburgs in, in Australia and Spain, but yeah, not that bad. Yeah. Um, so yeah, pretty much when whenever something crazy happened, Henry the Sixth just would shut down. Um, and uh, so during his reign, uh, the the uh, son of John of Gaunt and Catherine Swinford, which uh, Catherine Swinford uh, was uh, essentially John of Gaunt's lover. So this is a uh, illegitimate line. You have the Earls of Somerset and later the Dukes of Somerset. John Beaufort, the Duke of Somerset, is Henry VI's uh, big ally that essentially Henry VI is snubbing Richard of York for John Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, sends Somerset to uh, France, where he does terribly, and sends Richard to Ireland, which is essentially an exile. Yeah, um, and also, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but also, this didn't also Henry VI have the same problem as his French great maternal grandfather that crazy, I don't want to say crazy disease, but whatever that problem he had, his mental, mental problem? Uh, his biggest mental problem was that he would shut down, like, essentially be, I mean, he wouldn't be comatose, but he'd pretty much just not be there. Yeah, I forget what that, that, that was called back in the day, or it's called now, but yeah, I think I think his whole, whole uncle, maternal line had it. Yeah. Yeah, because there was a mad... Mad King of France in there or somewhere. I think that was his grandfather. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Margaret of Anjou is actually a really important figure. She, uh, the sources don't like her because, of course, powerful women. The sources never like powerful women. <laughs> she's essentially trying to fight for her son's birthright throughout this thing. And she's a close ally of the uh, the Duke of Somerset. So yeah, uh, Edward, I mean, not Edward, that's his son, sorry. <laughs> Richard of York is kind of just done with being snubbed and everything. And so he starts off the Wars of the Roses by saying, not, not that he wants to become king, but that he wants to become essentially the power behind the throne because it a disaster happens in France and Henry's gone off and he comes back i think this is when the battle of saint albans happens yeah i also think yeah but i also think this i think i guess like like i mentioned the, i think I, 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 I could be wrong remember this again but i also think this is a, a time like when, when henry's mental condition kicked in and so richard yeah. took over as you know because henry couldn't do it mentally do it for a while 
Yeah, so Richard essentially takes power, but Margaret doesn't like him. So you just get this struggle between the Lancastrian and Yorkist clans. Uh, the reason why it's called the Wars of the Roses is because the her the heraldry of both houses are roses. Uh, the red rose and the white rose. And it wasn't called that during the time. It was... I don't think they had a name for it at the time. Uh, it was named by Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare. Years later, after the it. obvious obvious winners had been proclaimed. Yes. Yes, and a after the Tudors had actually gone away too. Oh, yeah. Oh, also, this is, and this chart doesn't mention it, but uh, both Hen like Henry. Henry the Sixth and Edmund were half brothers to their mother. To their mother. Henry the Sixth and who? Edmund oh, Tudor. oh, Edmund Tudor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of connections, and that's one of the big problems for England during this time. You have a lot of uh, retainers and stuff. Uh, so Edward the First. I know this is going back, but it's sort of important to understand how how things got the way it is. He's not even on here. Uh, he's the grandfather of Edward the Third. The, the guy, the the guy from the from the probably really uh, historically accurate, yeah, uh, Braveheart, Braveheart movie. Yeah, Longshanks. Uh, he essentially professionalizes the army, and you get these power. Powerful retainers uh, taking uh, taking places in um, taking you know like professional soldiers. Before you had to levy your soldiers uh, through a complicated system, like everything is in feudal the feudalism. Yeah, like oh, <laughs> I, I give you this land, but you promise to fight for me if I need you to. Yeah, and give me some of your money and everything uh this was giving this was you can have professional fighting forces and and uh these landowners would compete for these uh retainers to become essentially the most powerful landowners and you actually get a feud between the percy family and the neville family uh right before the wars of the roses which uh, is seen as a essentially on i th i think that the earls the earls of warwick yeah they're nevilles so westmoreland uh is up in the north uh it's i'm pretty sure it's in uh it's around the area of lancaster it's in um it's on the border with scotland but the western side not the eastern side they're they're fighting against the percy's and it's uh essentially the prelude to the wars of the roses yeah yeah also if i I'll talk about this later on but it's not again it's not on this chart but like the lady and neville thing was both the wife of edward prince of wales son of Henry VI, and the wife of Richard, brother of Edward IV. Yeah. Um, R Richard Neville, or the early Earl of Warwick, it says the kingmaker there. That's because, essentially, whichever side he backed for a little bit became the king. Uh, Richard, the Duke of York, eventually gets killed in a battle. I can't remember the name of it. Um, is it Tewkesbury? I'll look it up. <laughs> no, not the Battle of Tewkesbury. There's so many. Richard of York. It 
The Battle of Wakefield. So he dies at the Battle of Wakefield. And that's when his son, the future Edward and IV. This is he, he'd take he'd take over the uh, the cause of the Yorkists essentially, but you know the, after the Battle of, of Wakesfield, the Lancastrians think they've won, but Edward the Fourth decides to say, "Well, I think Richard originally." eventually decided that he was going to become king. Yeah. I think I think I think I remember that right, but claiming it and and you know actually doing it two different things and actually having it are yeah, they're quite they're quite different. Um not that early right. Um so yeah. Eventually with the aid of the Earl of Warwick Warwick, not Warwick. God, we, English people, come on, pronounce your <laughs> pronounce your syllables, guys. <laughs> the Earl of Warwick, uh, they they eventually win, and uh, Edward the Fourth becomes king. There's a big problem though. Warwick has a plan for England and for Edward the Fourth. To kind of, you know, solidify Edward the Fourth's reign and make England and Warwick uh, put them in a more solid position, but Edward the Fourth and that's Mary, his daughter, daughter's off to the that line. Yeah, he he wanted to. Uh, he, I'm pretty sure he wanted to marry Anne Neville to Edward the Fourth, but I'm not sure. He, so Edward the Fourth loved his women, <laughs> and uh, there's a story that essentially he, uh, Elizabeth Gray, who would eventually become his wife, did pulled what, uh, oh my God, what is Elizabeth the First Mom's name? There's so many. I think names. I think they were called the Woodvilles. Uh, I think some people call them the Woodvilles. Oh yeah, Wood Woodvilles. Yes, Woodvilles. Oh, it says Elizabeth Gray on there because she was originally married to a Lancastrian knight who was who had the last name Gray. But yes, the Woodenvilles. Uh, the Woodenvilles were Lancastrians. So you can see how this is a betrayal of the cause, essentially. <laughs> but he really liked Elizabeth. So, yeah, he marries her behind Richard Neville's back. Uh, currently, Henry VI, Margaret of Anjou, and Edward, Prince of Wales, they are in, that's why I thought the Ballad of Tewkesbury. Okay. Uh, they are exiled in France. The Earl of Warwick goes to France, says, okay, if Edward marries my daughter. Okay. I'll help you become king. So 1471, 1470, they come back. They beat Edward the fourth. Edward the fourth has to flee back to York. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Has to flee back, has to flee back, bleh, back to York. Uh, they have the country. Ed Edward, Prince of Wales, is eventually going to marry Anne Neville. And uh, Margaret of Anjou and the Earl of Warwick want to press on York, defeat the Yorkists, and the war. Henry VI will be king forever. But as you can see by the dates on there, uh, it doesn't end that way. <laughs> the Battle of Tewkesbury happens. This is where I got the Ballad of Tewkesbury from. Yeah. Uh, essentially, <laughs> so the Lancastrians think that they can win this battle because they're up on a hill. But the you wind. Mean, of you, you, mean, you mean they have the high ground? Yes, they have the high ground, like Obi-Wan. But this time, Anakin actually 
is more powerful. <laughs> uh, the wind is blowing in uh, the Lancastrian's face. So the longbow essentially was the the quintessential English weapon at the time. So whoever could win this battle won the I mean, when the the skirmish between the archers, they yeah. won the battle. The Lancastrians would fire their their bows uh, because of the wind. They'd never reach their marks, and all and it said that all they could hear from out of the wind was the laughs of Yorkist soldiers as they picked up uh, the arrows of the Lancastrians and then shot them back. And uh, yeah, the Lancastrians lose, and it looks as though. The Yorkists are going to hold the uh, monarchy from now on. And for a while, they do. Yeah. But uh, then, uh, sorry, I was going to say, but then, I might just keep that ahead a bit, but like, but then that little marriage of Edward the Fourth, you know, a little, a little brother of his came and said, maybe that little marriage wasn't a, a, a legal marriage. Yeah, yeah. Edward the Fourth really should have stayed away from Elizabeth Woodville. <laughs> it kind of ruined a lot of things. Um, if you can see up here, Edmund Tudor. Edmund Tudor is married to the daughter of John Beaufort, the Duke of Somerset, the original uh, de facto leader of the Lancastrians. They have a son. This son largely stays out of the Wars of the Roses, but he eventually gets exiled to France. He even is excluded from the succession. From from way up here. Yeah. He in order to survive after the Lancastrians lose, he's he essentially gives up his claim to the throne. But some events back in England will happen. Yeah. On this side, yeah, Edward the Fourth. Uh, nice. He loved his women. He loved his food, and uh, it ended up killing him. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I think I read uh, the audio book. He, he ate something he shouldn't have ate. Like some food he shouldn't have ate. ate. The, the, the real of him, he's like, "Yeah, I'm fine," and it killed him. Yeah, uh, he had two. He had two sons, but they were very young. I think like, Edward like, the Fifth was only five years old. I think he was like. 12 i think it was 12 12 and 10 i think or eight maybe eight 12 and eight they were like pre they were really they were, young they are pre-teens at least yeah so originally the woodvilles who were former lancastrians they are they're the guardians of edward the fifth uh but his edward other fifth, uncle wanted to yeah, be a guardian yeah. uh edward the fifth would actually never be coronated um yeah, he's put down as a king, but he would never be coronated. Uh, Richard essentially does a coup. Uh, and he, this is all in 1483. Uh, yeah. He takes control of the king. Um, and, and, they, uh, and, and, and they say since that marriage was, quote, quote, illegal, then that then he's a bastard. That can't be king. So that's, I'm the king now. Yay. Yay me. <laughs> yeah, R Richard becomes king. And this is oh. where you get. This myth about, uh, well, okay, not myth, legend about the princes in the tower. Oh, also, we, we skipped, I think we skipped the part where the older brother, George, you know, sided with the Lincrestons for a bit. So he kind of got kicked out of the line of succession. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the Duke of Clarence and Warwick were both the engineers of bringing Henry VI back because Edward IV. I think slighted him. I don't remember exactly what he did. Probably the, probably the, I think probably the marriage thing. Yeah. Uh, Maybe. So, yeah, Richard uh, decides, yeah, I'm going to become king, you know? This whole king thing, I like it, you know? <laughs> uh, and so this kind of renews the Lancastrian cause, but then it's like, who do we have? Everyone's dead. And there's this one guy, guy in France by the name of Henry Tudor who says, okay, I guess I'll become king. And then I, I, I don't know what happened. 
I think it's, I don't know what happened before or after. He might have promised before the war that he would marry Edward V's older sister. Maybe, maybe it was after. Uh, it's after. They, it's they, they the, because he marries her, yeah, it's definitely after it I, I, was a it was a power play to essentially uh, unite the two roses, unite the two. Sides that, of the I, I don't know. I said it was probably, like said it was after, but I heard this rumor. Maybe it was just a rumor that that he promised to marry her before he, he went up to England. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure there were a couple. Of, I might be thinking about something else. Rebellions. Of people claiming to be Edward, Prince of Wales, but I might be thinking about something else. Maybe you are. Um, yeah. Even though, well, like I said, like I said, that legend thing, it may or may not be true, but at the time, maybe people believed it would be true. And, and, and they're like, I guess Richard III wasn't that popular, maybe? Yeah, uh, it's mostly legends from the Eliz- Elizabethan and... Uh, Later, Shakespeare talking about the princes in the tower. But essentially, you know, you could see them playing in the tower. And then eventually, after a couple of uh, days, where'd the princes go? And, of course, they blame Richard III for uh, murdering them in the Tower of London. Either murdering them by order or just, like, not caring that they were dead. Yeah, uh, murder by neglect. Um, so Richard has been demonized, and I know RJ, when he was originally going to be on here, wanted to talk about that, about if Richard was actually, like, evil. And I don't like using the term evil or good for people in the past, because, of course, they're doing what they think is necessary at the time. I mean, if you're... I guess if you're willing to overthrow your nephew, I guess you're, in our you're, modern you're, standards, you're, you're, yeah, you're not that great. Kind of like, kind of like how, <laughs> uh, like Abraham Lincoln would be a racist to today's standards. Yeah, by by our modern standards, he would be a very uh, Richard the Third would be evil, but he's not any more cruel than anyone else. Margaret of Anjou, it, it was, uh incredibly cunning and incredibly cruel in her own right uh anything that well to keep your keep your line and the line of success and some people will do anything yeah it, yeah exactly um so two years after richard comes to power a battle happens at bosworth uh essentially uh Richard saw a chance to win. He sees he sees Henry Tudor and his reta- and his retainers just sitting there, and Richard decides I'm going to go. Or is it the other way around? Oh yeah, Richard goes and charges them. But I think that's how it went. I'm not getting it. Uh, essentially, yeah. Uh, Henry wins. And he would remake England into his own into his own vision. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. First, he, like that, Henry won. At first, I think first he claimed the throne by right of conquest. Yeah, and then he would uh, he would go back and essentially say that. He would go back and retroactively uh, change the date of his supposed accession to make it before yeah. Richard so that he could say, yeah, I was the real yeah. king. I was just defending my throne. Yeah, and then he also, then he, I think he also, he also changed the thing saying, yes, Edward IV's marriage was legal and his kids were technically king his descendants were kings so edward the fifth was a was a technically a king and so his older sister is technically a a, a princess too and then they yeah. married him he married, he married yeah, her. To, to unite the branches and essentially uh tr- this is like a symbolic uniting of the country uh not only will henry clamp down on this retainer problem uh he'll make the english monarchy more autocratic as we'll see by his son as you would see by his son in 
after him, Edward the, I mean, not Edward, Henry the eighth. Yeah. Oh, 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 but, but plus also not only Henry the seventh, their des descendants were, were the future Kings and Queens of both England, Scotland, and later Great Britain. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, Elizabeth decided to stay at least in the public view a virgin, but that's a different. Well, I mean, yeah, and plus, uh, his daughter married. Uh, I forget it was Mary or Mary, I think, or Margaret. I forget which one it was, but he Margaret she, Tudor. She married the the king, the James the Fourth of Scotland, which later led the line of the Scottish, yeah, the, the, the Stuart kings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is like. This is essentially the death of medieval England. I don't really like using that term, but f for people that don't really... This is the death of the England of, like, Richard the Lionheart, uh, William the Conqueror, figures like that, and was the birth of essentially... The Tudor monarchy and the Renaissance in England. Uh, it becomes incredibly peaceful in England, if not just because the Tudors were. Yeah. <laughs> very at, least in, at least until, at least peaceful politically. After this, then the, the religious problems began. That's yes, a whole, that's, a new, that's a whole new story. Different story. <laughs> yeah, politically, uh, the feudal structure is essentially like done away with uh and it's pretty much because of the because of the wars of the roses yeah and also <laughs> sorry uh, also the, the, there's called the houses of lancaster and york but technically they're still the, the house of plus plus plantagenet yeah yeah they're, they're still, still the plantagenets <laughs> yeah uh the plantagenets ruled since henry the second yeah um so they'd been they'd been ruling monarchs for about 300 years when they finally when the last one finally dies at uh Bosworth yep so in the so we pretty much did the history of it. Any other things you want to bring up that happened? Like, so I guess, I, 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 well, you, like you said, later on, this was uh, mytho say mythologized a bit by about 100 years later by the uh, Shakespearean time of the Shakespearean time, like of of his granddaughter, Elizabeth the first. Uh, I, I don't know if it was a, I don't know. He operated while James was also king. I don't remember. Well, well, that, well they're still both are still descendants of, of the winner Henry. Yeah, Henry the seventh. So, and he really demonizes Richard the third. I'm pretty sure that's one of his plays. Richard the third. You know the yeah. hunched, the hunched uh, uh, king. The my the, my horse quote. Yeah, <laughs> my kingdom for a horse. Oh, they recently found Richard the Third's remains and were able to uh, identify him. Uh, yeah, uh, he he essentially didn't get uh, a proper funeral by uh, English royal standards. Yeah. Uh, he essentially was just you know buried yeah, where I he died. Yeah, I saw that. Then they, I think they claimed that they found his nephews too, but I don't know if they actually verified that or not. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I just remember that they were able to, and he did actually have that uh, that back uh, deformation, and it's probably he he wasn't a bad soldier. You might think that he was because he lost a war but he was actually a good soldier and it's actually suspected that because of his uh uh his back issues that he actually felt more comfortable in the saddle it, it supported him better yeah. than when he walked so he yeah, liked being in the horse 
way more yeah. than anything else. Well, like, 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 like people say, history is written by the winners. Yes. Yeah. Um, definitely. It's probably it's probably why Margaret of Anjou also gets like a bad rap. Powerful women throughout history get bad raps uh, in the sources. And Margaret of Anjou is seen as like some like cruel, um, like willing to use anything to get her son and her husband to stay in power. Just, yeah. Kind of the same way that uh, the first Plotas' wife, uh, I forget her name, but she, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Yeah, Eleanor, yeah. yeah who, who's like, who, who, who's to get her son, keep her line in power, her, her, her kids. Well, yeah, she was very famous for, <laughs> well, I don't know if this is famous among people that aren't as familiar with history, but she liked having her sons rebel against her husband. And she had been married before. She'd been married to the, to the, the king, king of France. The king of France who, and yeah. they had two, they had two daughters. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know if it was that, but for, you know, French and uh, but it was then or later on, you know, daughters and, and France don't go together that well. Yeah. Yeah. Because Edward the third, uh, the hundred years war and this outgrowing of it, which is the wars of the roses essentially starts because the direct line of the Capetians in France, who were the reigning dynasty ended. And there was a, a big issue on who would su succeed and you you had the two major factions edward the third who is the daughter of a french princess and the val 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 valois I think it was. and the valois who were the uh closest male line descendants without any females in it of of hugh capet but yeah and yeah that's gotta be complicated you know you have to go back. Hey, male, no, no, go back until they find the the male, the, the closest male direct line. Uh, yeah. You know, England uh, at least uh, they fix that now. But England at the time, they they tried to avoid females being rulers until at least until Elizabeth the first, or, Mar or actually Mary, Mary, Mary the first. But uh, like they still starting with you know. Uh, Edward the Third's granddaughter, Henry the First's daughter, they still sometimes went through the female line. Yeah, yeah, they'd at least do that. So it's, I mean, it's still pretty confusing as you can see by this family tree. But um, yeah, it, actually, it wasn't until to, like very modern times, like a few years ago, that even the oldest female could even be queen because because before it was it was like the first kid then the third son second third son then went back to the first female i think now with uh the current princess william's kids that the older sister can surpass his her younger brother in the line of succession there was actually another civil war in english history before this that would lead to the plantagenets um Oh yeah, the the the, the uh, anarchy. Steve, Steve, the Stephen, Stephen and Stephen and uh, Empress Matilda. Matilda, the 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 nephew and the daughter nephew of Henry the second versus the daughter of Henry the first. I mean, yeah. Well, the, the nephew of uh, Henry the Henry the first. And yeah, the Henry the first was a son of William the Conqueror, and yeah. his son died in a drunken stupor. <laughs> in the English Channel after winning like a campaign, <laughs> yeah. him and a bunch of nobles died. And so yeah, also I think Stephen was supposed to be on that boat, but he decided not to be on the boat. At least that's the legend says. Yeah, well, Henry kind of brought all the vass all of his vassals together, and was like, "You are going to let my daughter be queen." And then, and Stephen was there, and then he was like, "Uh." No, I think I think it was a two part problem that, that listen from the I read the audiobook one when he when Henry died, he first died, Stephen, Stephen was in England, you know, so he was there on the spot, yeah. Uh, and Matilda, two, yeah, yeah, Matilda was down in France 
yeah. her husband was the kind of Andrew, which some of the Norman people didn't like. Normans and the Andrews didn't like, I think, did one very well, at least according to the audiobook. Yeah. Um, she She's c- commonly known as Empress Matilda because she had originally been married to the Holy Roman Emperor. Yeah. But he died. So then she married Geoffrey Plantagenet, and the rest is history. Yeah. Oh, also, also again, not much of this, but um, her father, Henry the First, mar- was married to the, a descendant of the original Anglo Angel- Saxon and Angel- Angel- Saxon kings. Yeah, uh, William the Conqueror had no um, familial claim to England. Neither did his son William the uh, Second, but Henry the First married. I think, I think her name was Margaret. Uh, she was the daughter of a of yeah, a I think, Scottish I think, monarch. I think it was. I think, I think it was Mark. Yeah, no, it's got Mar- Yeah, I think it was Margaret. I think, I think, that's what, I think it was named that their daughter named after him too. I I, I can find another chart, but yeah, but yeah, but but they were a, a descendant of of William Iron, Edmund Ironside. Edmund Ironside, yeah. One of the half brothers of Edward the, the Confessor through their English line, not through the Norman Danish Viking line, because that's all complicated. Oh, yeah. Anglo-Saxon England is extremely complicated. That's why I love it. But yeah. like I said, that's a whole di- that's a whole different episode. <laughs> yeah. But an interesting thing that uh during this the the uh, hundred years war, Edward the Third actually used the idea of French people coming up, conquering England, and uh, extinguishing the English language as a way of rallying his people. Um, which is funny. <laughs> Because he's descended from a bunch of French people that came up but didn't try to extinguish language. Uh, the Normans actually left the English to their own devices, except for yeah. the Herring of the North, which... Yeah, but, but I think for a while, the the French language was the nobility language, and the English were the commoners. Yeah, that's why you have uh, pork and pig, beef and cow, Uh the names of the food is based off of it's technically not French, it's old Norman, which is a dialect of French, but so you know, I think but but I think between between Edward the Third and Henry the Henry the Seventh, the 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 more modern English language was came to effect, you know, as, as an actual language of both common and royalty. Yeah, uh Richard the Second. I'm pretty sure, I could be wrong, he's the first English king to have gone out in the public and spoken English. There was a peasant rebellion during his reign, and he came out and he spoke a rousing speech in English to his uh, peasants, and they all went home. Which was like the best thing he ever did as king, like almost the only good thing he did as king. <laughs> uh, was that when he was still a, a kid, or was he an adult by that point? I don't. I'm not that good with dates, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I'm good with the broader picture. But like you, like you said earlier, before the thing started, historians don't really need to know dates that well. <laughs> Yeah, they just they just need to know the broad the broad aspects. I mean, I'm better with dates when it comes down to the Anglo-Saxon period, because, but even then, it's like, uh, <laughs> this is a little. <laughs> but yeah, it shows the flaws of the English feudal system that weak monarchs will constantly have to fight for their thrones and uh yeah and also with both henry the richard the third and henry the the sixth when you're become a king as a kid you be sure you be sure you have a a, oh and and, and also henry edward the edward the fifth yeah be sure sure your uh caretakers aren't gunning for the throne themselves (laughs) yeah uh 
Henry the Sixth actually became king when he was a child, and this was I, because I think, I think Henry the like Fifth, months, six months old, I think, almost, almost maybe uh, a year. I don't know if he was that young because I'm pretty sure Edward the Fifth is the youngest ever, or is it? He's the shortest reigning. Maybe, uh, yeah. I think it's very short as rain, but I, I think I think if I remember, I gotta look it up again. But I think Henry the Sixth was a baby when he, when his parents when his daddy died. Yeah, his his dad died. I think of dysentery, what they called consumption back in the day. Um, Henry the Fifth. Interesting things about Henry the Fifth is that uh, he was a rambunctious uh, prince who didn't seem to follow orders, didn't seem to listen to anybody. But the minute he became king, he almost took on this chivalric, at least according to the sources, they could be biased because, you know, he wins one of the greatest battles in English history. Okay, look it up. According, it's according to Google, you know, it's not maybe accurate. It says, Henry VI, he was born on the 6th of December, 1421 at Winter Castle. He succeeded to the throne as king king of England at the age of nine months on the first of September, fourteen twenty two, the day yeah. after his father died. Yeah, he- Henry the Fifth really. I mean, to be honest, uh, John of Gaunt at least keeps not John of Gaunt. Oh my God, wrong one. You know, uh, the caretakers of Henry the Sixth, the Somersets. They at least uh, they they didn't want a gun for the throne because they couldn't they they were bastards so yeah you know what also I, I didn't notice this like earlier but no I mean earlier like years ago but that the king that the the kingmakers were like closer cousins to Henry the seventh and stuff than they were to the other other family trees oh well, yeah. Um, this was because Edward the third, essentially, and the Kings afterwards tried to ensure that only family members were in high positions, which probably, which, you know, in the short term, of course, it keeps the kingdom together so that you can go out on campaigns, try to conquer France. But it also leads to the fact that these people might end up using their claims to the throne later on. And uh, yeah, also right there, they were also connected to the they were the 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 wife of Richard the du- Duke of York too. So like yeah, family trees are complicated. <laughs> yeah, especially feudal family trees. <laughs> like hmm, let's okay, we gotta marry your fifth cousin once removed because. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, you have like this very small pool of nobles, and you do, and you want to set up alliances it's not more like oh i don't want to uh i don't want to sully my genes with this woman it's more i want alliances with these people over yeah. here so i'm going to i you know marriages for alliances again was, was, my, was my one of the problems with the, the, this marriage right here of edward the fourth and elizabeth like like she more of a she was more of a, a peasant girl than she was a royalty. She, she was low nobility and her family was Lancastrian. She was married to a Lancastrian. She was a widower and uh, English people do not like widowers. Uh, uh, it's why Edward VIII ends up abdicating in the 20th century. It's why we have problems with Meghan Merkel today. <laughs> Stuff like that. They don't. They they don't like widowers. <laughs> Megan, that's the the wife of uh, William's brother. Yeah, Prince Harry. Yeah, Harry. Harry. I can't remember if it was Harry or Henry. I mean, yeah. Oh, so, so yeah, I... the Tudors end up taking control of England, but. It's a, it's one of those things where it's like, a, it's a fast burning rule with a lot of chaos, and then it ends abruptly. Oh, in- a lot of chaos! Like, like you, like you, like the say, like the reign of the nine day queen for a while. Uh, yeah, uh, that's Jane Grey, right? Yeah, Lady Jane Grey. Yeah, because you know, no, like, 
because because Ed, like Edward the I think it was Edward the sixth six was like you know instead of my Catholic sister being queen, how about this girl over here? Yeah, <laughs> I th I think it's pretty ironic. Henry the eighth went through six wives so that he could get a son, and then his son dies before he <laughs> before he's of age. <laughs> And and his daughter and his and his daughter by uh oh my god Anne Boleyn yeah Elizabeth turns yeah. out to be a pretty good monarch yeah he he didn't need it in the end you know but I understand what where he was coming from because he was the king right after this massive civil war spanning generations. <laughs> Uh, so I can see how he's like, ah, I want to, you know, have a more secure reign. Yeah, even though, even though technically none of his descendants were ever, were were in the future, were in the future uh, line success, and it was more of his sister's kids. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's possibility. It's really hard to um, follow the the uh, illegitimate lines that come off of them because uh, the illegitimate lines will you will usually become uh, nobility in in their own right uh, I know that Princess Diana was a de was a descendant of an illegitimate child of Charles the second stuff like that like randomly these people will come up but there's none that I know of ever. yeah that's a I guess that's a whole different line where only like like the this like only one of the only one of James the sixth slash first descendant out of like like hundreds of thousands of people because he was they were the first Protestant and all the all the, the Catholics were cut out out. Oh yeah, Georg Ludwig, who'd become George the first. This is originally going to be his mom. But yeah, that this is the end of the the feudal problem and the beginning of the religion problem. And tied in with that is how much power the king will have because during this entire period, um, parliaments de developing the uh, the first king to really hold a bunch of parliaments is Edward the first. Yeah, and Parliament is growing in power, and eventually, yes, yeah, I think it was starting, starting with uh, John. The first Parliament Parliament was mainly uh, the barons and nobles and stuff, but later on it became more of a commoner thing too. Yeah, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Uh, pretty sure that distinction happens around this time. Uh, but yeah. Uh, this ends the feudal era and begins the the struggle between religion and the struggle between parliament and the monarchy. Who's more powerful? It will lead to a king getting put on trial <laughs> and then beheaded. Charles the first, a short lived British Republic. That's a weird sounding thing. And eventually Protestantism wins and Parliament wins, but so do the monarchs because they stay. They yeah. they don't leave. I well, I try to find some more pictures and stuff. Anybody in our chat have any questions for any of us? I was really hoping that James RJ could be here too, but I guess he couldn't make it today. Yeah, because he was the guy with all the questions, man. <laughs> We have three viewers, at least maybe one, two viewers. I know, but come on, anybody? Questions? Questions? All right. So, anything else you want to talk about of this time period? Hmm. No, it's just. I mean, it, the main thing is that it's the end of the medieval period. Beginning yeah. of the Renaissance in England. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, oh, also, yeah. 
I, I, I mentioned before, yeah, also another thing, we mentioned this earlier. Um, uh, around this time, not uh, in England, other countries, there were a lot of, there were a lot more intermarriages, like, like, like Henry the Seventh married, married one son, then laid the same son to the to the to the to one, to one of the daughters of the uh, the, the newly united kings and queen of Spain. Yeah, Mary the First uh, married. Uh, there were four Philips in a row. I can't remember which number it Philip was. Philip II. Philip, Philip II. II of Spain, and he became uh. The is it Ure Uxoris, king of through his wife, king of um, yeah, but isn't vassal another term for protect? Uh, vassals are the ones that are underneath, but you have you have a you have the king, then you have a higher noble, like middling Duke noble, Duke or Earl, and then noble. Can, yeah, the, 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 how the ranks happen levels up. You have dukes, earls, barons, counts, viscounts, all these different. Yeah, uh, it's not always. It's not always uh, clear. It's not always clear, and that's why a lot of people have had troubles uh, with defining um, feudalism for a long time. Mark looked at, but lately. People have started to be like, eh, this term feudalism. <laughs> it's not really a real thing out in the real world. It's more. Kind of. Oh, this is. Yeah, I think that's another term for protector. Yeah, no, I think no, I think protector. I think it's more like, like I said. I think it's more of a like subordinate, maybe. Yeah, the vassal is the subordinate. They provide things in turn for land, essentially. Yeah, this, this picture is kind of clear, but yeah, there's Henry the Henry the Eighth, kids, then Elizabeth, Edward. Uh, Oh, here's the Scottish kings. I, oh, I think that, I think over here is late, late Jane Grey. Yeah, uh, she was never crowned, but yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty sure Queen Mary was originally going to let her live, but then was like, ah, eh, I changed my mind. Be like and Mary. Yeah. Mary had phantom pregnancies too, so she had her own mental health issues. Yeah, which, which which would have been even more complicated because that would, like, that that would, it would be like, I think at the time they were starting to break away from the Catholics, but they were still part, some Catholics there, you know. But after after her, they're like, nope, we're Protestants now. Oh yeah, Mary was the daughter of Henry the Eighth's first wife, who was a Catholic, and Henry the Eighth. Yeah, who? Uh, who yeah, like I said he, he was the daughter. Sorry, he was the he was the daughter of the first wife, who was yeah. the, one of the daughters of again the United Catholic Spain, like the the daughter of yeah. Ferdinand and Isabella, who who like recently united Spain, like a few years later. Yeah, um, yeah, and and uh, Henry the Eighth, he actually he starts the English Reformation, but he died believing that he was a true Catholic. Um, yeah, like, but like, Catherine like of Aragon, like still, she's definitely yeah. she, like, like he was still. He a, was still what? I think he still considered himself a Catholic, but he's like, but I'm in charge, not not the Pope. That was all. That was, that was his big thing. It, yeah, and that's a thing. That's another big issue throughout English history. Henry the Second constantly battled the Church over who's who's more who's more powerful in England when it comes to the Church. Is it me, the king, or is it the pope? And he actually, one of his uh, childhood friends, Thomas Beckett, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury, yeah, gets mur gets murdered 
uh, and he has yeah, to because uh, yeah. he thought. I think. I think again, same audio book. He, he thought. He, he, thought, he thought. I'm I'm powerful, so I can point this guy. I, I, I can point this guy. You know, as a, as the make him jump the line. Point this guy as you know the uh uh watch the cat the, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Everything you find, but then that he was like, hey, you may be my friend, but not not, not since I'm a religious guy. God follow or from the Pope. <laughs> Like like what? Yeah, no. It, he, Henry the Second, and Thomas Beckett were childhood friends, but uh, so when Henry the Second puts him into power, he's like, oh, yeah, he'll follow my beck and call. But it turns out Thomas Beckett was more loyal to the Pope than Henry the Second thought, and it led to some problems. But <laughs> yeah, so this has actually yeah. been. A problem for the English monarchs, and eventually Henry VIII is just like, you know what, screw it. I'll become the head of the Church of England. Uh, we're still Catholics, but you know, um, we're just having a a little break from the Pope for a little bit, you know? <laughs> and it just becomes permanent. But yeah, uh, so I think. Okay, we're back, we're back. Like then we talk about other stuff in the future, but anything you have your you think do you think on your channel that you want to advertise or anything? Uh not yet. Uh currently, uh so currently my grandpa is I, I gave him the idea. Uh my grandpa worked for Boeing. Uh uh so he worked on a bunch of space program stuff he worked on the lunar rover the lunar orbiter and stuff and i was like i could corner this market on youtube okay someone who actually worked on the space program comes out and debunks flat earthers space deniers and all that <laughs> not really uh he's recently been diagnosed it, it's not that bad of a cancer but uh uh it's he's got cancer he's and his eyesight sucks, his uh, hearing sucks, and I just wanted to make sure he could, uh, he felt like he was doing something, you know? He's had a very tough uh, quarantine period um, over the last year and a half, and so currently he's working on his intro video where he will tell you all that he worked on and stuff, but I think I'm going to make a... Help him make stuff. All right, cool. I, I hope he doesn't dox me, though. I can't, I can't, I can't, can't wait to see it. As for me, next week, we will be, I, I'll be looking at history again, but a little bit further back. Not not as quite as recent as the War of the Roses, but we're going to check the Permian period. I think that's a little bit further back in our history. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know of any kings from the Permian period. Maybe Gorgonopsids. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but but spoilers, it does not. It does not have a happy ending. <laughs> kind of like this doesn't have a happy ending for Edward V. <laughs> Poor kid. But anyways, all right. Thanks for thanks for being on. Hopefully we can. Hopefully we can. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me on. Yeah, hopefully we can later on next maybe next year we can we can do some deep dive and more English history and medieval history. Yeah, All yeah. Right. I mean, I love talking about history. I kind of wanted too. to mold a little bit more about Edward the Third, you know. But <laughs> like, I said, like, like I said, that could be a whole different to a whole new topic. Like I said. Yeah. yeah, sometimes when uh, we're only two of us, we, we can run out of things to talk about. That's like, it's like, it's like that. We, yeah. We, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I really but, wish RJ was here, but it's okay. He needs to get better internet, though. <laughs> uh, definitely. But anyways, uh, uh, you, you, have any, you have any closing statements you want to say? A catchphrase or anything? No. Nope. Right, good. Then. Never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see you all next time. Bye.
if you just do it, it'll turn out okay. And today I am I am with a brand new guest who's never been on the show before. The Scythian bead. Scythian bead. Sisyphean bead. <laughs> Welcome to the channel. Well, hello. Thank you for allowing me to come on. <laughs> All right. Now, quiz for, quiz for you out there. Which king was the, was the father of a king, the grandfather of a king, the son-in-law of a king, and the brother-in-law of a king? The answer? Name this title, Henry the Seventh. That's a lot of kings. <laughs> True. Yeah. So, real fast, what's what is what is what does your new name mean? Uh, okay. So, have you have you heard of Sisyphus? I have not, but then again, I never I didn't hear about the original BD either until a few months ago. So, oh, this has nothing to do with uh with bead. Uh, it's just that um Sisyphus uh in Greek mythology he was being punished for something i can't remember what it was for he had to continually try oh, to is that the guy that had to roll the rock up his, a hill yes and every time he nearly got to the top it rolled back down and he'd have to start over again so yeah um yeah. my yeah, just... sisyph <laughs> my sisyphean task is trying to make people stop uh synonymizing nation and state <laughs> Oh. Yeah, it's 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 funny though. I just I I just learned about the, I read about this guy literally like a week ago, a few days maybe a few days ago. I was I was listening to one of the uh, Percy Jackson audiobook things. And he that they, they they met him in, the, in that book. Yeah, <laughs> the first rock and roller. <laughs> yeah, so that's my Sisyphean task. I technically I cannot say that i fully came up with the name it was a uh, dapper dino but i liked it so i put it on <laughs> nice so uh hmm. that reminds me what would you can at this time at this time of of, of day in 14 when the, when the story semi begins in 1485 what was england considered then a nation or a state? Uh, well, you definitely have the state that is the kingdom of England. Um, it's really difficult to talk about nationhood when it comes to the English people at the time because uh, nationhood uh, differs from eth in an, an, an ethnicity in the fact that uh, it's supposed to be us. Uh, what's the word? Uh, you're supposed to be aware of this identity that you have. So uh, I don't know if there was an, an awareness, but definitely after uh, the Hundred Years War begins, you do start getting this sense of uh, a nation within the English people. Okay, and also, I guess you consider this this episode at the end of a trilogy. We started with the, the War of the Roses. We went to the prequel, Edward the Third, and now we're pretty much at the sequel, Henry the Seventh. Yeah, and the end, like, a, like one little continuous story. Yeah, the end and the beginning of a new conflict, technically, but yeah, that starts under his son. Yeah, but Henry the Seventh is technically. The ancestor of every current, every every king and queen of England since since that since then. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. And that's that's our man right there. Look at him, look at him. Looks, Isn't he looks, beautiful? It looks kind of skinny compared to what his son will be. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <sighs> All right, so. Let's move into the context for Henry VII's reign. Henry VII comes to the throne uh, amid two different uh, events. You've got the Hundred Years' War between England and France. By the time he's on the throne, 
England has fully lost this conflict, but they still have outposts in France like Calais. Um, and after the Hundred Years' War and kind of during the Hundred Years' War, you have the Wars of the Roses, which is a civil war in which uh, different branches of the Plantagenet family are vying for the throne. Uh, and the central power, uh, it didn't technically last a full hundred years, uh, the Hundred Years' War. It's multiple different conflicts put together that is collectively known as the Hundred Years' War. Uh, but yeah. So you have different branches of the Plantagenet family, and you have a complete breakdown of the centralization of the English state. Uh, local lords just have uh, an immense amount of power. So um, a lot of Henry VII's main tasks will be trying to bring together England after these and trying to project it back onto um, the world stage and keep it relevant. Yeah. That reminds me, I think I, I, I think I mentioned this in the, in the World of the Roses, I might not have, but how come they were called the Lancastrians and the Yorkists if they were technically were still plagtagonists by, by last name birthrights, but they, they chose the name of their dukedoms instead or something? Yeah, uh, so the Lancastrians, uh, they're descended from John of Gaunt, who is the uh, first Duke of Lancaster, while uh, the Yorkists were descended from Edmund of Langley, the first Duke of York. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why they have the different names. Okay. I was wondering, it's kind of, kind of like the... Like the future, kind of like the French kings, even though they were technically still capets, they took the yeah, name. They took the name of their like dukedom or county or something like, like B Bourbon or Valois or whatever else they, they had. Or yeah, Lins. and then you have further divisions in that, like the Valois have the Valois Angoulême, who eventually become kings like Francis, uh, the first and Francis the second, um, and. Valois Orléans, and you actually and you actually have the uh, Capetian House of Anjou, which is very confusing because uh, another name for the uh, Plantagenets is also the House of Anjou. Uh, very confusing. That would end up becoming monarchs in Italy, and that's actually sort of important for uh, Henry the Seventh's reign because it kind of gets France off his back a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, as I, I know later on, H H Henry, at least for his children, Henry, the, at least not the plan was Henry the Seventh, uh, did the thing with the with the five, which was now one Spanish kingdom. We used to make four or five Spanish kingdoms. They they made, they did a little crossbreeding too, or at least attempted to. Uh yeah, um, yeah. Uh, the creation of the kingdom of Spain happens during this time, although. Technically, uh, the unification doesn't happen until uh, later with the uh, um, Spanish War of Succession. But well, yeah, yeah, and with their grandson Charles the fifth or first, fifth and first. But that's a different story altogether. Well, connected. it's kind of it's kind of connected, yeah, kind of because Henry the seventh uh, was was ahead of the game and seeing how uh, a united Spanish kingdom would uh, be a world power. So his early life. So Henry the seventh was born three months after the death of his father. His father was Edmund Tudor, who was the first Earl of Richmond. Richmond, if I'm not mistaken, is in Wales. Uh, his family are descendants from Welsh no uh, nobility. Yeah. I can't remember if they're descended from monarchs, but yes. It's true. And 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 also his his father was the half brother of King Edward. I mean, not Edward, uh, King Henry the Sixth. Yes, I did a little. Uh, 
chart thing if you could pull that up too. If that's possible. Let's see. Hold on, I might get it. Let me check my things. Well, uh, Jasper was a uh, Lancastrian in the Wars of the Roses because he was married to Margaret Beaufort, who is who was the daughter of the leading Lancastrian during that stage in the war, the Duke of Somerset, who is ultimately uh, descended through an illegitimate line uh, from John of Gaunt, who is the uh, first Duke of Lancaster. And... Uh, Yes, he he's also descended from the f the French monarchy as well through his mother. Yeah, but well, that's, that's kind of it's a born three months after thing. It's like kind of thing. It's like well, he had sex with his wife and then died right after, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Well, wasn't yeah, yeah. It was Henry V's wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's technically yeah the bro the half brother of Henry the Sixth. So more reasons why he's part of the Lancastrian club. He ends up getting captured fighting Yorkists in Wales, uh, and he'd eventually die in Carmarthen Castle. This causes an issue for not only uh, Henry but his mom. Uh, Margaret Beaufort, who was only 13 when she had Henry the uh, Seventh, by the way. Bit young, if you ask me. Yeah, true. Um, I can find that picture real fast. Yeah. So his uncle Jasper Tudor eventually uh, brings him into the protection. However, <laughs> the things for the Lancastrians weren't going to continue going well. Uh, and Edward the Fourth eventually takes the throne. Jasper Tudor flees, but Henry and Margaret, his mom, are allowed to. Do you mean, stay. Mean, Ed, mean, Ed, you mean Edward the Fourth? You said Henry the Fourth. Oh, Edward the Fourth. Sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> yeah. We got the fourth part right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, so he was allowed to stay, but uh, William Herbert. Uh, who as a Yorkist eventually takes up the uh, I can't remember if he takes up the earldom of Richmond or the earldom of um, Pembroke but he eventually uh, takes them in in 1469 during the Wars of the Roses when uh, the Earl of War when Warwick the kingmaker, as he is known, uh, for he brought two kings into power, uh, went over to the Lancastrians, uh, and Herbert was executed. Meaning now, who's going to protect Henry and Margaret? They flee in 1471 to Brittany, which is this, uh, which is this northwestern. Oh, okay. The second deal, I can't. It won't be saved as an excellent picture, but oh, well, that's uh, I I kind of had a on slide five. There is a little family okay. tree in the bottom okay. there, but the this is Brittany right there, northwest France. Uh, it's yeah, wasn't that wasn't that named after like the former Britons that 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 escaped here, like like after like say either. Either the Anglo Saxons or the, or the uh, something like that. Yeah, there there was a migration of um, Britons that eventually became known as the Bretons, and they still they still live there. Uh, they still speak their language, but uh, uh, there's a bit of a soft persecution of Breton uh, of the Breton language right now. Um, and there has been for a while, but yes, they they are ultimately Celtic, and um, 
are descended from migrants that fled the Anglo-Saxons. So, a lot of stuff starts happening in Brittany, actually. Uh, Brittany's uh, pol politics is a little... Uh, oh, I'm not there yet. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, Brittany has a lot of problems uh, with tough politics. And Francis the second it of Brittany is the uh, Duke. He eventually gets sick in 1476 and his advisors took this chance to try and sell Henry to England. Uh, but in a great move, Henry feigned illness and eventually was able to escape after word came that Francis had gotten better. Uh, so now I'm ready for the next slide. This is the beginning of his rise. Yeah. So in 1483 Christmas, uh, he pledged to marry Elizabeth of York, the daughter of Edward IV. Uh, and now, you know, the most senior living heir of Edward the fourth seeing as his yeah. uh, sons were murdered Richard uh, By, uh, presumably Richard the third's orders yes presumably uh, there's been some uh, speculation that Henry the seventh had something to do with it as well but I yeah I'm not gonna get into that. <laughs> Okay. Cuz it's just it's just a whole bunch of stuff that yeah. you know but yeah his mother who was married to a yorkist is at, was actually going around the kingdom going hey 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 uh she was married to lord stanley or uh, darnley or something like that uh uh henry the seventh's mother yeah uh, so, so obviously she got remarried after her first husband died yeah, she got remarried a couple of times. But uh, she campaigns across the country saying, hey, this is Richard III guy. He's not very nice. We've got a nice Lancastrian guy over here. His name's uh, <laughs> Henry III. He's pledged to marry uh, Elizabeth of York. Maybe we should let him go in. So he ends up getting in with Henry Stafford, the second Duke of Buckingham, to attempt to uh, come from Brittany to England this fails and Buckingham is um executed yeah and no, be I'm sorry go ahead I was gonna say I, 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 while researching this I'm pretty sure it's just a rumor but there is rumors about going apparently going on about Richard the third also wanting to marry his niece Elizabeth oh uh, yeah that would be really gross but <laughs> well, of course of course back then you know especially well I, I guess it wasn't that gross with the spanish with the hasburg spanish people but yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah uh, Why does yeah well yeah because richard the third really needed an heir i don't think he had one true i i think his heir was like his well his son, uh, he, son he, he, didn't a, he didn't actually he did have a son with Anne, but he died yeah, uh, I know that it was he. His heir was only like married to a Plantagenet and wasn't actually a Plantagenet. But yeah, uh, so Henry's first landing is a is an absolute failure, and the Prime Minister of Brittany is actually uh, conspiring with R Richard to extradite Henry. So Henry has to escape to France. During this time. Yeah, but you can get special. Uh, uh, if you if you're if you're good old chums with the Pope, you can get, uh, you know. What, well, you know, not exactly well, the way like look yeah. the other way. <laughs> yeah, please look the other way. Let this happen. <laughs> so, yeah, he flees to France. And France actually gives him troops and supplies to uh, 
to invade again. Of course, they, they love seeing England going through a civil war. That means England's not going to come fight them again, you know, yeah. especially since uh, France right now is actually attempting to uh, take over Brittany because they don't have full control over it. And let's go distract the king. We'll, we'll be over here. I just little, we're not gonna, we'll, we'll be about in this little area. No, no, you, you, you do your thing. We'll be over here. Yes, yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll be minding our own business. We totally won't be using this at all. Um, Henry gets support from the Woodvilles, who are the who is the family of Edward the Fourth's wife, uh, wife, and mother. Uh, and also mother of uh, uh, Elizabeth of York. Uh, he has a small French and Scottish force with him, and they land in Wales, and they're actually and they're able to gain support uh, from the Welsh people. Uh, eventually, they get about five thousand to six thousand soldiers. Um, Richard the Third had seventy five hundred to twelve thousand soldiers. And they meet at the bat. Uh, Henry wants to ensure that this is a quick war, so he goes. He doesn't want uh, Richard to be able to continue to build up forces, so he goes straight for uh, Richard. Who and they meet in uh, Leicestershire at the Battle of Bosworth Field in, on the twenty second of August, fourteen eighty five. Uh. Originally, his stepfather, Lord Stanley, and uh, Henry Percy, who was the Earl of Northumberland, they were on Richard III's side. But they either switched sides or just left the battle during the battle. And uh, I think uh, Richard III makes like a suicidal charge at uh, Henry, thinking that he can kill him, and he ends up dying. Yeah. And this is the battle that people know th probably know through the uh, William the Shakespeare. Th yeah, yeah, because of uh, the play Richard the Third. Yeah, this yeah. this is the, this is the uh, this is when people say the end of the Wars of the Roses is, but uh, there's still it's technically not over. But uh, now. Richard the Third has to stitch the country back together, essentially. Yeah, of course. I'm guessing that that play might have been a little one-sided, you know, considering considering the, the current the, the time the current the current uh, rulers were descendants of the winner. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, yeah, you know that to the the tutor. Uh, smear campaign against Richard really did his job on him. Uh, okay, so next slide. So he declares himself king by right of conquest, but he does it for the 21st of August, 1485. That way, he can conveniently say that every single person who fought against him at the Battle of Bosworth was committing treason so he can confiscate their land and eventually get his own land, get his uncle's lands back uh, and uh, start taking the lands. Uh, by the way, up in the uh, top right-hand corner, you've got the princes. It's the princes in the tower. Yeah, that's going to be important for later because uh, people start saying that they're the princes in the tower. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's the rumor that uh, Richard was still alive. Yeah, Richard of Shrewsbury. Yeah. Um, and Edward, Earl of Warwick, was the ten-year-old son of the brother of Richard the Third, George, Duke of Clarence. He was then sent to the Tower of London so that they could. Keep an eye on him. You know, um, he immediately he went for his coronation. He didn't convene parliament. He didn't uh, convene the barons. He went straight to coronation so that he had all the power. 
and he had everything set up so that when he did eventually meet them, you know, they would be on his side. Uh, and he gets cor- coronated on the 30th of October of 1485. He issued an edict that any gentleman who swore fealty would be secure in his property and person. Essentially, uh, if you like me, you get to keep your land. If you don't like me, uh, I'm going to take it from you. And you don't want, and you never know when you're yeah. one of those guys. Ah. And taking and taking it from you would, would, would have been the best. Just, just taking it from you would have been the, the in like the, the nicest thing he could have done to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it also helped that a lot of his. Uh, enemies were killed at the Battle of Bosworth, so that helped a lot. And he eventually married uh, Elizabeth of York in order to f- fully uh, legitimate his uh, uh, his Clay. reign. There yeah. was a little bit of issue because uh, technically there was some stuff saying that he couldn't become king because. Uh, uh, when they made the the uh, dukes of the earls of Somerset um, yeah, the, legitimate, like 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 that the line the line from where his, his the um, John the Gaunt's line that he came from was was like not technically eligible for the line or something like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, they they were originally uh illegitimate but i think henry the fourth um he uh made them legitimate just said your line can't become part of the throne i can't take the throne um this became like a huge thing like a huge documentary where this guy was like oh this means that we have to go find the real king of england and it was some dude in australia or something <laughs> oh yeah i heard about that also plus he could plus he like he i think he claimed it by also right of conquest instead of two yeah kind of like, kind of like william the conqueror did yeah but this was more you know you marry elizabeth of york you bring the yorkists on your side because yeah. now she's the she's the most senior heir of edward True. the uh fourth I'll, also be like like I can make it real fast. Like, oh, 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 you, you technically, oh, technically, I'm not the son of a, the son of a legitimate king, but my sword here says I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but it definitely helps out Henry VIII to be able to say, yes, I am the uh, grandson of Edward the um, Fourth. Oh yeah, and was that Titus Regerus? Is that the thing that Richard III made? He had to, re- had to repel that said Edward the Fourth's kids were Ill- illegitimate too. Yeah, that was the thing that uh, Ed, uh, Richard the Third said. Uh, oh, yes, Edward the th- the Fourth technically said that uh, he was married to this one lady, so he couldn't be married to Elizabeth Woodville. Therefore, uh, his sons and daughters are illegitimate. So he uh, repealed that, of course. But there were still issues. There were still rebellions. You have in 1486 the rebellion of the Stafford brothers. Never got any fights. Um, a funny one was in 1487. A dude named Lambert Simnel claimed he was the Earl of Warwick, who was still in the Tower of London. He was a uh, he'd be a uh, nephew of Edward the Fourth, but he was still in the Tower of London, and he eventually got defeated at Stoke and. Henry the Seventh showed him clemency and gave him a servant job in the kitchen. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, you can be yeah. harsh, you can be mean, be like like a uh, like, like nice little kid. You can be a servant. I won't kill you. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then in 1490, the biggest one that happened was uh, Perkin Warbeck, who wasn't even uh, fully English. I think he was part Flemish. He claimed to be Richard of Shrewsbury, who was one of the um, the uh, princes in the Tower. But I, I, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be funny, like like I, I'm the, I'm like I, I'm I like I'm the rich I'm rich I'm I'm the old, little Richard boy. 
it was from the and then you're yeah you're my brother kill him <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no you have actually a lot of these uh different things throughout history claiming oh yes i am this person come to me and we will restore me to the throne we will restore the bloody blah to the throne uh Something like this happened to start the Third Macedonian War way back during the Roman Republic. Stuff like that. I, I heard that they found bones under there. They ever they, they ever do DNA tests to find out if they were, were them or not? Uh, I have not kept track. Oh. I know they found Richard the Third's bones in a parking lot, but yeah, in in Leicestershire, yeah, or was it in Leicester? Not just Leicestershire. Yeah, they found it, and it. it that was interesting because it showed that he was actually like a uh, hunchbacked or crookbacked or something like that. Um, eventually, um, Henry the Seventh would uh, feel that Warwick was too much of a threat, and he'd eventually execute him in 1499. So let's see how Henry the Seventh restores royal authority. The main problems that you have from the Wars of the Roses and the lead up to it is livery, which is when the upper classes flaunt their inher their adherence by giving them badges and emblems. These badges and emblems are like the uh, uh, the uh, Lancastrian Rose, the Yorkist Rose, uh, the Heraldry of Your Kingdom, the Heraldry of Your Lord. Um, and then, because they could use that to essentially be like, hey, I'm loyal to this person rather than to the king. Uh, and then banned maintenance. So you couldn't have too many male uh, servants, essentially meaning you couldn't have as big of an army anymore, uh, which definitely helps. So uh, Edward IV actually created this thing called the Council of Wales and the Marches uh, because... The Welsh lords and the marcher lords were really powerful because, of course, these people are constantly dealing with uh, rebellions from the Welsh and trying to subjugate that area. So he makes the he brings back the Council of Wales in the marches and makes it so that Wales, the marches, Cheshire, and Cornwall, Cornwall will be under the jurisdiction of the Prince of Wales, who is the heir to the throne. Another thing that he uses in order to cut through the extremely the extremely convoluted English legal system is a privy council known as the Court of, of Star Chamber. Uh, so he has his closest confidants. He can have... Uh, issues come to him and then he will tell he'll be able to uh, deal with them quicker than if he had to go through parliament and stuff like that uh, he is and the main thing that he did to ensure that local lords didn't have too much power is that he essentially played them against each other using these uh, using the position of justices of the peace uh, justices of the peace were made up of different uh, landowners in a shire. The shires are the different, um, you know, you, you heard it earlier, Cheshire, stuff like that. It's the various different administrative units that make up England uh, that are usually uh, governed by Shire Reeves, which is where we get sheriff from. These justices of the peace were appointed by the king every year. And if you were, um, and if you weren't appointed every year, that would be seen as a dishonor to you. And uh, so you do everything you could to listen, uh, to cozy up with the king. Uh, 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 justices of the peace essentially they oversaw all acts of parliament but which is really this is really important because Henry the seventh is known as a very frugal and thrifty monarch they were unpaid yeah right. I heard I think I read somewhere in the book that 
he uh, Henry the the seventh like got like a surplus of money for his a little bit surplus oh. of money. Oh yeah, the 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 powers of the Tudor the Tudor dynasty would not be the same if it weren't for what Henry the seventh did. He he essentially made it so that uh, England was profitable again. Of course, they were going through constant civil wars, so it was all bankrupt. But he was able to uh, bring back all that stuff. But yeah, prestige was just enough for the justice of the peace. So they didn't have to be paid, which was very nice for Henry the Seventh. And economics was a main... Uh, was one of the main things that he had to work on, uh, which is the next slide. So if you've ever heard of Morton's Fork, it comes from this period. The Archbishop of Canterbury, John Morton, uh, helped with the new taxation system uh, to ensure that people weren't, you know, uh, shortchanging the monarch with their taxes or not paying their taxes. Uh, he essentially said, if you didn't spend much, that means you, you have a surplus that you can uh, give to us in taxes. But if you spent a lot, that means you have enough money that you can pay us your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is one of the this is one of the things that I don't like so much about Henry the Seventh, but again, you gotta remember. Uh, this is a time before democracy. You can't. He he was very he 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 restored the treasury through a lot of uh, capriciousness and uh, lack of due process. But you know, uh, yeah. Morally, for me, not very high, but it worked, and he was able to restore the treasury. I like this loosen of free choice, left or right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's Morton's fork right there. <laughs> so next is foreign policy, which he's he actually did a lot on that. Uh, so, uh, if we, so like real fast, uh, this, you said what was I, I think later on, definitely later on, uh, like, but. I think there's more in this descendants that, ha that happened, but like, w w was the England can still considered an absolute monarchy at this point, or they 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 still go they going on like like the king had less and less power than they had before? Uh, yeah, uh, it was they were definitely an absolute monarchy. He just still uh, the rule of thumb for Parliament at this time is you are just being used as a justification for what the king is doing. Uh, he still circumvented them a lot through the Privy Council. So, uh, but because th the kings are using the parliament more and more, uh, you, you are still seeing uh, an increase in the power and prestige of, uh, of parliament. Uh, but yes, definitely the Tudors, they're the height of the absolute monarchy of uh, England. And you wouldn't start seeing the fall of absolute monarchy until the Stuarts because of their uh, not so, uh, not so good relationship with parliament. They, they, they weren't used to dealing with that because they were originally monarchs of Scotland and they didn't, Scotland didn't really have that. So, they didn't like using parliament. They they really didn't like it. So with foreign policy, he has to ensure that he he has to ensure that he keeps his possessions in France and keeps France from becoming too powerful. And he also so a lot of his foreign policy will be based on this on trying to keep France either contained or not becoming too powerful. So, he, in 1489, he signs the Treaty of Redon with uh, Brittany, his old uh, 
buddies uh, to send 6,000 troops to start fighting the French. So we're actually getting English forces fighting with France again outside of the Hundred Years' War. But they're, they're, at, they're fighting uh, because France, of course, wants to take Brittany. But oh, yeah, oh yeah, I can back right back with it. I I I'm, I'm glad I'm glad I didn't hear Oh, I, I finally got the crown back. Wait, wait a minute, what's happening to Brittany down there? Like oh nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he has to go back. Uh, but the problem is, is that uh, Breton politics is has always been rather uh, difficult because uh, they also have a problem with. Uh, rival lords not liking each other so because of that uh eventually it just becomes too much of a burden and after three years and after france wants to start going to war in italy in order to gain gain territory there based off of uh their relation to the capetian house of anjou not the plantagenets uh uh, they signed the Treaty of Etaple, and actually, during this time, France was supporting uh, what, what's his name? Um, the guy who who was uh, saying that he was Richard of Shrewsbury. Uh, uh, so during the in 1492, uh, a very momentous year for uh, <laughs> for us <laughs> here in North America, uh, France agreed to pay 159 thousand pounds in 1492 money okay that'd be like a lot more today yeah uh they stopped supporting the the rebellion but england had to recognize france's right to Brittany. which he was like yeah good riddance these people they keep they keep they keep uh, doing all this stuff that i don't like i don't want to deal with them anymore <laughs> <laughs> Your friend's <is> problem now. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can go get annex. You guys, <laughs> you guys are. I like this money. This is a lot of money. You know, I'm gonna take that. <laughs> uh, the treaty. Oh, okay. what? No, go ahead. I, 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 I was gonna say. I don't know if it, I mean, you mentioned this later on. Business foreign policy. Does that does that include marrying his three kids off to for, foreign for, uh, foreign royalty? Yeah, that's the uh, Treaty of Medina del Campo and the Treaty of Perpetual Peace. Uh, these were actually, uh, the Treaty of Medina del Campo was uh, signed in 1489, which is a little earlier, at the same time as Redon. But uh, this is where, essentially, uh, so you have two kingdoms in Spain at this time, the Kingdom of Castile and the Kingdom of Aragon. Um, Castile has always been the more powerful one. They're the ones that are centered around Madrid. Uh, they're the ones that are essentially, uh, modern day Spain is the successor of Castile in a lot of ways. Um, the kingdom of Aragon, uh, is the other one. They're centered around Barcelona. Um, they actually held land. Which in, which one was the center one? Like one was more towards the Mediterranean, the other one was more towards the Atlantic. I think. Uh, Castile Castile is uh, in the center. Uh, okay. Aragon Aragon is on the uh, uh, Mediterranean. They also held land in Sardinia and Sicily and Naples. And w w w this is eventually, you know, part of why there's war going on in Italy right now. So, because of uh, eventually the Habsburgs who marry um, jo Joanna the Mad or something yeah, like that. Yeah, the, the daughter of both, the daughter of the joint monarchy. Is Isabel of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon. Um, or was it the other way around? Ferdinand of Castile. No, I think Ferdinand of Aragon. Um, so uh, this new combined monarchy of Castile and Aragon, uh, they, of course, have a lot of uh, yeah. uh, hostilities with France going on. They're, they're, they're part of the people trying to keep Italy out of the hands of uh out of the hands of France. So in the Treaty of Medina del Campo, uh, 
England and I'm just going to call them Spain. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't matter. They're Spain. Uh, they come together with a common co policy towards France. And this is where uh, uh, Henry the Seventh's first son, son, Arthur, Prince of Wales, and Catherine of Aragon uh, get married. Or and at, least she's plan, the, at least plan to get married. I don't, I don't think you actually got technically got. Yeah, married. they're 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 betrothed. Um, yeah, it, like one of like one of the Spanish daughters was married to the to the uh, to the heir of England. The other, the other one was married to the heir of both the Holy Roman Empire and the Netherlands. Yeah, um, not quite at this point because uh netherlands at this point is still held by the burgundians but yes well, I, I, eventually because well, i why well, I, I thought that i thought really because i it, the time, yeah no no it 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 happens very close after this okay. uh henry the seventh actually has some issues with the burgundian netherlands which okay, isn't cause... yet under the Habsburgs, but it eventually gets there really quick okay. um okay. I, I, remember if I, I might remember this wrong thing because I thought uh, um, the uh, husband of the mad girl was his name Philip, the, Philip or something. May, yeah, Philip the Handsome, I think. Something yeah, like was that. the was the his mother was it wasn't his mother wasn't his mother a, a Netherlands prince or something like that or yeah 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 uh uh. But it it still doesn't um, go over to to him until a little bit later. Okay. Let me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It. One second. Let me look it up. Look, look, look it up. <laughs> yeah. I'm just remembering uh, this from a book I read about Charles. I, I'm oh no, this. I was wrong. Yeah, you're right. I'm wrong. Yes, you're right. My I'm 20 year old wrong. memory is still intact because I read a book about this in, in my in my high school days back in the 90s. So like I, I read a book about Charles V. I, 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 it's well, all... yeah, I I knew that he got it, but I thought that it was still held by the House of Burgundy at this time, but it's not anymore. Um, well, well good, good 20 year old memory. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice job. <laughs> um, yeah, so Joanna the Mad marries that guy. Yeah, and then in 1502, you get the um, ironically named uh, Treaty of Perpetual Peace with Scotland. That's when he marries <laughs> one daughter to the James uh, He marries his daughter, Margaret Tudor, to the monarch of Scotland, James IV. And this is ultimately extremely important for later, as James IV's great-great-grandson? Yeah, uh, great-grandson. See, James V's son, Mary, granddaughter... James, great grandson. Yeah, great grandson eventually becomes both king of Scotland and king of England. Uh, of course, throughout the Hundred Years' War, you have this thing called the Auld Alliance uh, between Scotland and France, and this is an attempt to break that up. Doesn't work out. There's and a reason why the Treaty of Perpetual Peace has a very ironic name. And he also marries at least. First, he, I think he marries his other daughter to a, somewhere somewhere in France, but that they don't have any heirs, to, that they don't have any kids. Uh, I think you might know more about the marriages than I do. Like, <laughs> but... uh, like, Ma like, married his other daughter was <laughs> was married to someone in France, I think. But then uh, they get married. Then, then they died, and she, she get married. To the yes, Ma Mary Tudor. Queen of France. She was married to Louis the Twelfth, but yes, he didn't have any kings. It eventually led to uh I don't think he had any kids, and it led to Francis the First, who was from a different branch of the House of Valois. And then, so, yeah. then she married someone else, which yeah. which line which it led to the nine day queen. Yeah. Uh the Earl of Oh Suffolk, I think. Francis Gray, yeah. Because Lady Jane Grey. Yeah. Uh, part of part of his uh, part of his policy was to build a better navy, which would ultimately become the backbone of the Royal Navy. Uh, and oh crap! I totally forgot to talk about how uh, in economy. Uh. 
what is it called? He established the uh, he established the forefather of the imperial and customary system of weights and measures. Oh, which, I forgot which, all which, which only America still uses today, I think. Yeah, um, but part of his policy is to build up naval uh, capabilities. Oh. Eventually, uh, Portsmouth, the oldest dry port in uh, Europe, and subsidi subsidizing the building of ships. Oh. And then for trade, trade with the Burgundian Netherlands uh, is really important. Uh, oh. The Netherlands and England will have a uh, big history of trade between them. Um, that will eventually lead to uh, England becoming uh, in the middle of the affairs of the Spanish trying to retake the Netherlands when they're rebelling. Yeah. And that begins with the Magnus Intercursus. There was actually a big giant um, conflict going on between uh, uh, the Burgundian Netherlands and England. They stopped, they stopped trade, but then they were like, Oh god, we're not making that much money. Let's just, you know. So it meant that English merchants were no longer taxed by the Burgundian Netherlands. Right. So that's a lot of what he does, but uh, also, in his also also during this speaking of foreign, foreign and navy and the naval navy, uh wasn't it during Henry the Seventh's reign that the first English explorer Came over to America, I think John Cabb or something like that. Uh, John Cobb, John Cobb, John Cabot, I think maybe his name Cabot, John Cabot, yes, yes, John Cabot. He might have, yes, he was, he was, he was uh, Italian though. <laughs> Not English, <laughs> but but he but he right. So well, so, technically, so was Columbus, but they, he 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 sold yeah. the English flag. Lots of Italians went to the different different uh, places to yeah. John and, Cabot, and and here began British's claim on Canada. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, they didn't go for Canada at first because uh, the French got there first. That's why yeah. there's a bunch of French Canadians, um, somewhere up in the northwest. That he 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 he. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. it it might actually be Hudson Bay. Yeah, I think I'm. Yeah. Yes, Cape Bonavista in uh, Newfoundland is where he yeah. went. Yeah. Of course, it'll be a hundred years like later until England went back there to claim their thing, and meanwhile, the Spanish, the Portugal, and the French have been there a lot of times. Oh years. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think England was really in the position to be going and colonizing things at this time. Uh, they didn't really have the wealth that Spain had or France had. Slow start, but they laid up for it later on. Yeah. Um, in 1502, uh, yep. if you go to the next slide, the man pictured to the right is Arthur, Prince of Wales. He dies in 1502. Henry VII was known for being uh, a reserved person. He would go into bouts of like anger at people, but he usually kept himself reserved. But he was just a wreck after Arthur died. And then in 1503, his wife died, which... In childbirth, I think. Yeah, which didn't help. He, he eventually tries to find other wives, but it was half-hearted. Yeah. Um, I think... I think I I think I heard somewhere that he was one. Of, he probably had a few, but he's probably one of the few kings that may, may or may not had active mistresses or something like that. Yeah, no, he had zero active mis mi mistresses at all, none, which is weird because uh, monarchs they love extramarital affairs. <laughs> um. So because of this, now he's in a position where he wants to keep Spain on his side, but like, his heir, who was married to the to Catherine of Aragon, he's dead. Well, like, oh God, what's gonna happen? I, 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 I have another son. <laughs> yeah, who who at the time was the Duke of York, actually, who would later become Big Ol' Henry the <laughs> Eighth. 
Uh, he had to get a papal dispensation for this. And the papal dispensation also said that he, if he wanted to, could have married Catherine of Aragon, Henry the Seventh. So, but that didn't happen because um, eventually, when I think was it Ferdinand, one of them died. It was either Ferdinand or uh, Isabella that died, uh, and uh, her stock as a as a wife kind of plummeted because she was no longer yeah. so coveted. But and he actually tried to make it so that his son would not. Uh, marry Catherine, but it didn't work. Uh, Henry VIII was intent on marrying her, and it's probably because uh, Henry VIII liked pretty girls, and Catherine of Aragon at the time was a very pretty girl. <laughs> of course, later this on, would, yeah. I think later on, he, he tried to use reverse that issue, like, like, uh, uh, like, oh, hey, man, you like, you like, hey, I was supposed to marry this girl at all because he was my brother's wife, so that's to be illegal. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, his love for pretty girls came to come and bite him in the butt. But um, yeah. Um, interestingly, uh, in 1503, uh, the Tower of London was abandoned by uh, Henry the Seventh, and he st and he started living elsewhere. And this is where you start getting monarchs not living in the tower of london anymore they go live off in palaces elsewhere throughout the country um and he eventually dies of tuberculosis in 1509 it's the tower of london is that where uh big ben is now or is that some results no that's on the parliament building i'm pretty okay. sure uh but the tower of london uh, everybody thinks it's it was like a prison uh it wasn't fully a pr it became more of a prison later on but uh it was originally the royal residence and stuff you know it's the castle where the king lives so because of henry the seventh you have a re you, you have a reinvigorated economy increased centralization which later writers like uh francis bacon will be very upset about but uh, you have more power within london you have more power within the king um and uh, ultimately uh the rest of those monarchs on that picture right there their reigns would not be the same if it weren't for what henry the seventh does during his reign and in fact i think that henry the seventh sets up england really well for a really long time and it's just absolutely um, destroyed by the Stuarts. He, he set up England for some great things, and the Stuarts were like, no, we don't like Parliament. We'll just have constant civil wars, you know? Let's just do that all over again. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'd actually, talking about ranking monarchs, I'd put him way over Edward III. Way over Edward III. There was a... I was on YouTube the other day, and then some dude was ranking the English monarchs, and he put Edward the Third at second. Second. Who was first? Uh I forget who it was. I I just went to see where Edward the Third was, because I want to see is this going to be a bad video or is this going to be a good video? <laughs> it was a bad video then. It was a bad video. <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, Second, uh, if anything, Henry the Seventh should be in. He should definitely be in the, the top ten. But he had him. He had him way down near the bottom, and I was like, well, "What is this? Why are you doing this to my boy?" Maybe he was. Maybe he was a pro Richard the Third guy. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know, man. I might have to watch that video all the way through. It kind of was like, "What, Edward the Third? That will I mean, be my." I mean, he probably wasn't the worst king ever, but it probably was like, like definitely was the top. Yeah, middling material. for me. Uh, this is my next Sisyphean task after the nation and state thing. <laughs> Edward the Third was not that good. <laughs> if, if, if you want to see the reasons why, go check out his write about him in, in the last video. Uh, card up, card up, card up, card up, card up. I clicked the card up there. Yeah. Um, 
Eventually, Scotland and England will unite under the Stuarts, who wouldn't have been there if it weren't for Henry the Seventh either. But honestly, yeah. the Stuarts could have been kept out of it. I, I'm not a fan of the Stuart kings <laughs> and queens. I, I think the only queens were were Anne and Mary the Mary the Sec, Mary the Third, right? Like second. Mary the Second. There hasn't been a Mary the Third. Yeah. Um. But still, like, oh. yeah, and they only got the king. They only they only became queens because they are Protestants and like no no Catholics. You're Protestants. You're you're in charge now. Yeah. On uh, in talking about that, uh, people probably forget a lot about Henry the Seventh because Henry the Eighth kind of like took that big belly and kind of pushed it out into the forefront, like saying, "Ah, my dad and my son." You're not going to know about these people. You're going to know about me. And then my daughters. <laughs> yeah. All because he, he he liked pretty women. Yeah. <laughs> His daughter that tried to return to Catholicism, like, and people were like, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. His son definitely uh, started the Reformation within England, separates England from uh, uh, Rome. And starts a, a couple centuries of just religious conflict that was kind of unnecessary. And was just because of the whims of the king. So uh, up to parliament, let's uh, let's be happy that they're in power and not kings anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have to say... I'm, I'm, I'm pro and not against what you said, because I can't... Kind of, at least... At least Adoptive wise, I'm kind of a descent, almost a descendant of the Stuart Kings. Ooh. That's my I last name. I don't, know, I don't know if we can be friends, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's my last name, Stuart. No, I, I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But also, it was only through like later on. It was also like like how James. Got the line through uh, Henry. It was his daughter. It was his daughter's Elizabeth that later on got the king to the Hanovers. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, uh, the benefit of not having Salic law, which makes everything so complicated. But then again, the Plantagenets don't exist anymore, so they're they're not like the Capetians. The Capetians they still exist because yeah, well because. The, the French people were definitely male, male line only, only males through the thing. No female descendants, only male descendants. Yeah, and and, and in fact, I think I think the last of them straight real line is, is gonna is going to is going to die now through uh, the future king of Sp Spain. The future, unless they have a son, the, that line's gonna die because because the king of Spain's. It only has daughters right now, so. Uh, yeah, but the Orleanist uh claimants still exist, and they are direct male descendants. Oh, that's but that's yeah, true. But that, but but as of as of current royalty, I mean. Yeah, yeah the the accepted, the accepted line, uh, but Spain never had that issue. They actually had a couple of uh Bourbon queens. Throughout their time, because but, Spain's but, not dumb. But I, but I think he, but kind but of. then he, she married her cousin, so still Bourbon. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's gross. It's gross. It's gross. These people. It's not as gross as William the Third marrying his first cousin, but oh, it's gross. Or or or, or 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 that Spanish crisscross of, of messing things. Oh, the Habsburgs. I mean, hey. <laughs> it ended up kicking them in the butt. You want to, ugh, and that's ugh. how the Bourbons got Spain because because of that little crossbreeding thing. Uh, yeah, there there was a succession, and that's actually where uh, Spain unites uh, because uh, for a long time the Habsburg claimant was king in Aragon, and the Bourbon claimant uh, Philip uh, the Fifth. Uh, he was only like monarch in uh, Castile, so they ended up uh, just uniting it and actually forming the kingdom of Spain and not just having yeah. the. But you know, everybody called it Spain anyway. 
But that that later on led later on led to the Spanish Succession War. Yeah, yeah. Which but that's a different but again, that's a story for another time. Yeah. Really important though. England gets Gibraltar. Super important. They still have. Yeah. All right. So what have we learned what, what have we what have we learned today? <laughs> yeah. What what have we learned today? We learned that royalty likes incest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The ultimate the ultimate learning right there. Yeah. Um th- this is you know, uh this is a period of reinvigoration for England and you'll eventually get the Elizabethan era, which is just the, the zenith of that. Um, but yeah, Henry the seventh is really important for all of that. And he, re- and he deserves to be more known. I get why he's not. His son's got a big belly and a love for women, but yeah. Oh, I, it reminds me I think I saw. I think I, I saw. I was watching this. I was looking on Reddit about these charts. Like I shared with you, that apparently the the two queens that he beheaded were like first cousins, second first second cousins. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that. I don't. I don't really fa- follow the families that much. I I like the uh, on the ground. Uh, perspective a little bit more than that, but yeah, no, that, that's interesting. But yeah, with me, well, I've 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 always studied like family trees and stuff. I've always been a gene- yeah. I've always been like genealogy. Yeah, but it's, it's uh, weird. But it's weird, also weird. That I knew they were connected, but I never knew how much all these family trees crisscross from each other. Yeah, uh, I have an un- I have a great uncle like that, and uh, I forget which. Uh... Confederate general I'm related to, but I'm not very happy about that. <laughs> but yeah, you, you can't choose your ancestry. Can't can't uh, can't choose my uh, relatives. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yep. I know. Like even even I think I read an article about how the great grandson of Robert E. Lee was all, was all was all, was was all for turning down his grandfather's statues. Like I'm, I'm fine with it. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, ultimate. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm. Yeah, I'm not gonna get into that. I'm not gonna get into that. I'm not gonna get into that. <laughs> <Dip store. laughs> <Another time. laughs> yeah, that might be my next Sisyphean task. <laughs> the st- the uh, statue tearing down bead. <laughs> yeah, all statues. Tear them all down. Trafalgar yeah. Square. Take it down. I don't care. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, uh, so. See, uh, Henry Seventh, yeah, yeah, you said, said, yeah, the next uh, f- f- four four rulers, four out of five rulers were Tudors. Uh, one more if you count the gr- the great the, the the temporary gray line. Yeah, um, the the, the Tudors surprisingly don't uh don't last that long. Even though they have such a big impact on English history, only about a hundred years, give or take. Yeah, but um, definitely, like, whenever you think of a king of England that's not a modern one, you think of a Tudor usually, or yeah. as an American George the Third. But that's just because you know, he yeah, was the- screw the guy. <laughs> He was he was he was the king during the uh, little squabble with them, <laughs> the little civil war between the colonies and the homeland. But uh, so, is there in a, about in a few months when we do this again? Is there any king or queen of any royalty family that you you, you would like to talk about? Uh, what about a broad topic? Ooh. Broad topic, sure. Like uh, maybe the invasion of Br- Britain by the uh, a- by uh, my folk, the the English, the Anglo Saxons. Ah, uh, when it went from uh, being a former Roman colony to uh, little seven kingdoms. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd probably have to talk a little bit about Roman Britain there too, but. Uh, 
that wouldn't be long. <laughs> I've got a big book about it. I could just <laughs> and that would be your time period that you were alive in, or your name, your your former name technically was alive then at least. Uh, well, four hundred years after, but yeah, pretty much. Right, he wrote about it at least. And and would that era end with Alfred the Great? Well, the Anglo-Saxon invasion kind of ends a little bit earlier. Uh, it more ends with the beginning of the uh, Viking oh. attacks. Okay, that's where you. I mean, you still get some expansion, but there's a reason why uh, Cornish people still have been trying to revive Cornish, and the Welsh people still exist. <laughs> Yeah, that that that's where the other I guess that's that's where the other Britons went. Some some of the Britons went to Brittany, other ones went to uh, the rest of them went to Wales. Yeah. All right. So, but all right. What do you say about a month from now, give or take? Uh depending on what's going on in the world, maybe a month, if, maybe if, a little if, bit longer. Uh, <laughs> if if if. if Current world events made studying for this a little difficult. <laughs> yeah, if yeah, if 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 Ukraine is still alive in a month or two, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 we 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 could talk about it off off stream, but yeah, it'll have to be a little bit. <laughs> all right, well, all right. So, do you have a catch? You you want to say your catchphrase? If you have, if you have one, I do not have one. Uh-huh. Uh, here, Slava Ukraini. And as I always say, never stop learning. Even 20 years later, enjoy the randomness. We'll see y'all next time. Bye. Thanks for watching. If you like what you see, you can always support me down below in the description. Them no PayPal or uh, Streamlabs. Or you don't give money, you can always buy some stuff off my Steam or Amazon wish list. As always, you can support me just by watching these videos. Clicking the like button, leaving a comment, and sharing these videos with all your friends. And all your enemies too. Hate watch happens. Anyways, I'll see you for the next video or movie or game, or anything, but in the meantime, never stop learning, and enjoy the randomness. Bye.